Good evening. Welcome to Board of Education October 9th meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session, please? Pursuant to the general provisions Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move that we meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to perform an administrative function and to consult with counsel. I have a motion to move into closed session. Do I have a second? Second. A motion is second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We're moving to closed session. Be back at 6 o'clock p.m. Welcome to Board of Education meeting of October the 9th. I'd like to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and stay up for a moment in honor of our troops at home and abroad. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice to all. Thank you very much. I need a motion to approve the agenda for tonight. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor, Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Well, Ms. Pease is on the agenda. Ms. Cole, is that Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Mercet? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. I also need now a motion to, for the approval of the minutes, the open meeting minutes from September 4th and September 19th. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, a motion is second to approve the minutes from September 4th and 19th. Uh, all in favor, Mrs. Wright. Board members, again, please respond. Your name is called Captain Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Harper. Yes. Mrs. Merced. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. I have five of the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Kane, are you recognitions? Excellent. We have several recognitions this evening. So, board members, if you would please join me up front. Good evening, everyone. So we have some very special recognitions tonight. Tonight we're going to start with, come right in, we're going to start with our youth apprenticeship uh, um, members and their sponsors. I'm going to ask Mr. Tali, our CTE and history supervisor, if he would come forward with me, please. <coughs> And you're probably going to help me with names, perhaps. So tonight we're happy to recognize five high school students who are serving as Queen Anne's County Public Schools' first youth apprentices. And that's part of the Apprenticeship Maryland program. As a part of the program, students are required to complete 450 hours of work-based experience by the time they graduate. Participating businesses are required to pay the students at least minimum wage and to provide a mentor to enhance their experience. We'd like to thank our business partners for investing in our students so that they have the necessary skills to be successful when they graduate. We'd also like to thank our youth apprentices for recognizing the need to build upon their skills so that they are career ready upon graduation. You know, we talk frequently about filling workforce demand right here on the Eastern Shore, and we are absolutely doing that. We have five brave young people who are the first ones in this apprenticeship program and we are looking to expand that but while we have them here we're going to recognize them I'm going to ask Mr. Tolly if he would like to do the honors in calling the names and the supporting business that is working with our students so we have we'll start with uh, Mr. Scott Carlson uh, Scott is one of our youth apprentices with Y River Marine so Scott if you would come up and you can yeah. bring, bring your Have with you? Uh, Why River? Rob Marsh. All right, come on down and do it. I love it. Come on down, sit to the 
my, my, yeah, my dad, Ken Carlson, my stepmom, Kim Mallory, and my mom, Wendy Carlson. Come right on down. Oh, cool. Are you going to be able to do, okay, you got somebody to help. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think I need to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Alan Yang. Alan is our youth apprentice with Dixon Valve. Uh, unfortunately, Dixon Val. <laughs> unfortunately, Dixon uh, was not able to send a representative. They had a company obligation tonight. Um, but I believe Alan has his uh, father here with him. Uh, Come on, Andy. Come on, Andy. Yeah. And if I'm correct, and you guys can get me wrong, I believe Alan um, would now be, as an apprentice, he'll be a third generation uh, Dixon Valve uh, worker. So, yes, it's very, very nice. Now we have uh, three youth apprentices that are with NetVision Consultants. Uh, we have Mr. Carter Mizell, Mr. Dylan Jenkins, and Mr. Andrew Beal. Did I get that right? Excellent. And we have um, with these gentlemen, we have Mr. Mike Winter, who is the instructor for our computer science program at Cal Island High School. And our representative from NetVision Consultants, Austin. Austin. You guys have uh, families here that you want to bring with you? Tell us who you have with you. Mom. What's mom's <laughs> name? <laughs> Anybody else? I have my mom's name and my little brother Connor. All right, come on, Miss Julie. Your mom has a little Miss Sarah, come on forward. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tolly. Congratulations to all. And next, we have our um, Energizer Bunny Award. And this award is given to a staff member or volunteer who just keeps on going. The award is sponsored by Bayview Financial through Chip Brittingham, Wayne Humphreys, and Mark Humphreys. Thank you, partners, for being here. Tonight's Energizer Bunny is Rebecca Frazier from Centerville Elementary. Ms. Frazier, come on forward. As 
as she comes down, Ms. Frazier was nominated by her principal, Ms. Teresa Farnell, who tells us that Mrs. Frazier works diligently and tirelessly to ensure that all of Centerville Elementary School's children get home safely via the correct transportation, and we know how important that is. She works countless number of extra hours beyond the school day to help students, families, and teachers with transportation changes and challenges. She organizes the dismissal buses um, um, and the procedures that go along with that, which is no easy feat for a large primary building. Uh, she does all of this while providing academic and social supports to students. She does it with boundless energy and professionalism, and Centerville Elementary School is lucky to have Mrs. Frazier as part of their dedicated staff. Let's congratulate our Energizer Bunny Award winner, Ms. Rebecca Frazier. Come on, Centerville, and husband and granddaughter. Come on down. next award is the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Shining Star Award. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is extremely fortunate in the quality and dedication of our employees. This award recognizes a Queen Anne's County Public Schools employee who shines. Our Shining Star recipient this month is Miss Brenda Brittingham from Centerville Elementary School. <laughs> As she comes forward, Principal Teresa Farnell says, this is why Miss Brittingham shines. She greets the children with a smile. She's always so helpful to the students as they go through the cafeteria line for a hot and delicious meal or for a snack. She also gets to know the students on a personal level, even down to their food allergies in order to keep them safe. And we thank you so much. Please come, um, please accept our congratulations and let us know again. We know we have Ms. Farnell here, so come on down and we've got your CES family. And who else do you have? My daughter and two granddaughters. Come on, daughter and two granddaughters. Dr. King, she also makes a good date for you. <laughs> <laughs> or dictionaries. Yeah. Was it something we said? I oh, know, we're losing the crowd. <laughs> See you guys. Thank you. Thank you all. We're done with school. <laughs> You can leave her. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Marsh. I heard you bought some now. No, it's me. Good. Thank you. 
Okay, good evening um, again for the ones that stayed back. We appreciate the audience. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, board member discussions. Uh, one, one thing I did that was um, very worthwhile, I went to the MABE conference for three days um, in Annapolis. And uh, it, it was very, it was a terrific conference. The MABE folks did a great job this year. Um, and I was there with Dr. Kane and we um, went over a lot of items that are useful, will be useful for us in the future. And there's where I get a lot of ideas. MABE is the Maryland Association of Boards of Ed. So you have a lot of boards of eds there from all the representatives from all uh, 24 districts. And there was a big group and a lot of conference talk and um, just really some really good um, good ideas for the future. And I'm looking looking forward to us implementing, potentially implementing some of them. Dr. Kane, um, she had was also with me. I thought maybe you wanted to add something to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It was in a little bit of a different format than, than it um, normally is. And it was very well received. We had lots of time to um, meet with attorneys and, and learn what the latest legisl legislation means to our school district superintendents did. Uh, we learned a lot there. And uh, we had some very motivating speakers, I have to say. Um, some former teachers of the year and um, national, nationally recognized speakers, very motivating. So it was a good conference. And it makes you um, really excited. It makes me, made me very excited about um, what we can do to improve things here in this district. Um, lots of great ideas. Um, okay, any other board members have anything to add? I attended a few things mm -hmm. um, in the past month. Um, First was the Queen Anne's County High School turf dedication along with um, Dr. Kane and some other executive team members. Um, and then we were very interested in how they put that turf in and put it together, yeah. so that was neat. Um, I had the honor of uh, presenting the awards at the Queen Anne's County High School Band TOB competition on the 21st. Um, and I also, attended the Teacher of the Year car presentation as well as the Commissioner's presentation of awards to her. Um, oh, and I also attended the Queens County High School Hall of Fame induction ceremony at the beginning of this month. That's it. Okay. Anyone else have any? I think, I think three mm -hmm. of us attended a um, Chamber of Commerce event that mm -hmm. honored the Teacher of the Year. Um, and I can't remember her name now, sorry. Heather, Heather Eflin. Eflin. Eflin, thank you. Mm. Yes, that was very nice at uh, Harris's Crab House. Yeah. That was very nice. Yeah. And I also, I think three of our board members and Dr. Kane attended the Chesapeake College seminar at Project Blue Future, which was very interesting on uh, workforce. I think Bob Walsh was just, Bob Marsh was just here about that. Some, I think it's very positive and I'm hoping we can get other counties to collaborate with us and Chesapeake College. Um, I thought the president of Washington College gave very mm -hmm. insight yeah. on uh, the future yeah. of education and the diversity we can have by our kids learning other things too besides just, just college. Not that there's anything wrong with college, but there's other opportunities out there that, and we just saw that this evening and uh, Mr. Colley was there. Um, I was very impressed and I think it's something that uh, this, this board I hope gets behind. I know our county commissioner's behind it and I hope two or three other counties can get behind it. Thank you. Dr. King. All right, so yes, it's been a, a busy start to the school year, but a great start to the school year. We are off to a great start. Um, of course, we did school visits with executive team members for the first week of school. Um, things were going well, the buildings were looking good, and the uh, students and our employees were happy. So we're, we're, we had a great start to the school year. Um, we also, on the 5th of September, we had the Queen Anne's County Goes Purple, and I attended that um, ceremony, gave greetings, and uh, comments there at the uh, Kent Island Volunteer Fire Department, which was great. On the 6th, again, with um, 
uh, several of our board members, and I know Captain Kelly, you were there, I believe, for the Kent Island one, and also Ms. Morissette for the turf field dedication. So we had that one, and we also had the Queen Anne's County one. Very well attended. The children are excited, and I'm sure our, our student board members may want to say something about that. It was great. Then we went on, and um, we had Mr. Bell to present at the county commissioner's meeting, talked about our ESSA consolidated plan, did a great job there with Mr. P as well. And on September the 13th, that was the Queen Anne's County High School dedication. We also had, and, and um, I mean, generally wouldn't mention this here, but just would like for the public to recognize that we are continually being monitored and ensuring that our programs are, are up to um, regulation and that we are doing what we ought to be doing and being fiscally responsible. So I just want to report that we did have our annual um, MSDE financial audit and they just completed that today and everything has gone well as it normally does. Just wanted to make that comment. I also attended a a work session at um, down in um, Alexandria, Virginia earlier in the month on US and China K-12 education um, opportunities. So opportunities for exchange students, opportunities. We had lots of conversation about uh, how we might be able to exchange ideas about environmental education. Um, it was a very interesting conversation and we will likely be making some connections there. So it was great. We had our teacher of the year reception, which has already been mentioned several times and, and that certainly was great. We appreciate the um, support from Harris's Crab House on um, September the 19th. That's when we had, um, I met with some of our Teacher of the Year sponsors for lunch. So we were able to start to carry out some of those. One of the things that we said last year was that, you know, as we have our sponsors contribute to staff awards and Teacher of the Year awards that we really wanted to develop a, a better relationship or, or deeper relationship. So I've been having an opportunity to go out and have lunch with some of them. No agenda, just a get to know you. Thank you for your support of our schools. And that was great, did that on um, the 19th. We had um, our teachers and um, I should say our specialists had data-wise um, professional development on the 24th. I was able to be a part of that all day long before we did the Teacher of the Year gift presentation at the uh, commissioner's meeting. And then I met with my team. We did a deep dive for our budget, sort of had a retreat day um, off-site. We thanked Chesapeake College for allowing us some space there so that we could dig deep into our budget and have some, some um, good recommendations for strategy as we begin to meet about that in October. And we had the Family Center breakfast on the 27th. They're doing great things there. I was able to meet with another one of our community members, Miss Mary Margaret Goodwin, which everybody knows. She's a fabulous historian and, um, and a great partner with us. And then on, this is something different, on the 29th, I wanna thank one of our employees, Miss Natasha Wright I, and uh, Mr. Brown, who is also one of our employees. I was invited to John Wesley United Methodist Church and, St. Brian's United Methodist Church, and I was able to um, speak. I'm not a preacher, and I told the congregation that immediately, but I was able to share some words and uh, encourage, encourage that congregation. So it was great. I, I appreciate Pastor Ned um, having me there. It was great to be there. So it's been a busy month. It's been great, and um, that's close to it. That's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> All right, thank you. Mr. Poluski. Thank you, Captain Kelly. I'll be very brief. Obviously, I've attended many of the, of the similar events that Dr. Kane mentioned. Two, I'd like to highlight uh, on the 23rd that uh, some of our board members did as well. In our partnership with uh, Hertrick Ford, we went to uh, Centerville Elementary School to award Mrs. Eflin with her car, or multiple cars maybe, uh, for, the, <laughs> for the mileage for the course of the year. It is always exciting to be there, to be a part of that. And it was so exciting to see the teacher's face, uh, but yet all the students cheering for her is always uh, just a, a delight. <coughs> On uh, October 2nd, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to attend the Title I uh, evening event uh, for our Title I schools at Sellersville Middle School. I want to recognize Mrs. Susan Walbert uh, and her leadership in working with our Title I schools and our Title I principals. Uh, was just an outstanding event. Uh, as you know, we have to have part of that uh, community engagement, uh, and they've done an exceptional job. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, student board members. Shannon, you want to start? Okay, let's see. Um, thus far this year, we've had um, four marching band tournaments, all Saturday tourn tournaments. So kudos to the marching band because it can't be hard getting up on Saturdays in a full uniform, especially with how hot it's been. So congrats to them. And as Ms. Morissette was saying, there was a tournament of the bands on the 21st. And I think there was about 14 bands there, which is the biggest turnout that we've had. I know in recent years, maybe even ever, and it's pretty great seeing them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously on the 13th, we had our um, new turf field dedication. I got to see the field at the homecoming game. It's amazing. I never thought I'd see it. <laughs> okay, and obviously I think the most exciting week of the year is we just had homecoming week, which is probably my favorite week ever, honestly. Uh, we have spirit week throughout the week. So Monday we had country day followed by Class Color Day, USA Day, <coughs> Throwback Day, and then Green and Gold Day, which is Friday. And Friday is also our pep rally, which is probably the most fun day of the school year if I had to choose one. So representatives from each fall sports team come down, give us the stats of their season. Uh, we see who won for homecoming king and queen and then homecoming court. And then we see who sings the fight song loudest, which seniors obviously won this year. <laughs> and then on Friday, we also had our parade. And our route takes us from Kennard Elementary all the way back to the high school. And I didn't get a ride on the float this year because I had the opportunity to drive behind it and drive our um, the 12th grade homecoming court winners. So that was pretty awesome. And then we had our homecoming football game against Kent County. And we won 28 to 8. So that was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then... Saturday, we had our homecoming dance, six to eight, which I saw pictures from it. It was pretty nice, I'd say. And some upcoming events we have on the 22nd at 7.30 is our Pops concert, which I'm very excited for being a part of the band. It features the concert and symphonic band, choir and dance. So I won't give away any of the songs we're playing, but I'm pretty excited. Um, marching band has two upcoming Saturday tournaments, the 12th and the 19th, so good luck to them. And then I know FFA leaves for their convention, I think the end of this month, I think it's the 29th, yeah. so I know they must be excited. Great. Nice. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Shin. So uh, a couple of board members already talked about our turf field ceremony and opening, which was a very exciting game, and I know that everyone's excited to play on the field, but last weekend, our fall play, 12 Angry Jurors, just opened. It had a great opening weekend, also, but this coming Thursday, so tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we have a free show. And then Saturday at 7 and Sunday at 2. So you have three more times to see it. Um, just two days ago, on the 7th, our quarter one interim reports were emailed out to students and families. And this week is our homecoming week and spirit week. So we're very excited for our pep rally on Friday at 1.30. We have our dance Friday night, 6 to 9. And then our parade at 11 through downtown Stevensville. And then we have our game at 1 o'clock on Saturday against Wicomico High School, which should be a pretty difficult game. <laughs> um, next week on the 16th, our sophomores and registered juniors will take the PSAT. Also on the 16th, we have our fall and band concert at our fall band and choir concert at 7. And then the week of the 22nd, we have application week at our school for seniors to get information and help during lunch shifts and whenever you can stop by the counseling office on their applications as deadlines are here and arriving. Um, and then finally, on the 24th, we hold our financial aid night at um, six to eight for seniors and their parents to come get resources and help for um, planning financial aid for college. Very nice. That's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do either of you know when it's college night at the schools? We just had college night last week. And is there one scheduled for Queen Anne? I think we had one on, I think the last one was the 12th. I, we got emails about having another one, but I don't know if it's set in stone yet. And there should be one at Chesapeake College coming up too. Mm, okay. They have college night, and yeah. like Broad Neck will have one, and so that there's and, uh, quite a few of them in the area for people to have an opportunity to speak to representatives of different colleges from around the country. And they'll do it again in the spring. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of colleges <coughs> visiting, I know, next week who will have stations set up during lunch shifts. Uh, good. Thank you.
A citizen participation in public comment period. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Please do not discuss items uh, related to negotiations. These items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item or an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. This is not the proper venue to address specific uh, student or employee person personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of indiv individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or process through available channels. Citizen particip participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when you offer critique. After all that, there's nobody listed. Is there anyone in the gallery that would like to talk? Oh, come on up. That's why we read it. And there's somebody available. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association, and I'm also an ELA teacher at Centerville Middle School. I want to invite parents, business owners, and all community members to the Kerwin Community Forum on Thursday, November 14th at Centerville Middle School. Our county receives 40% of its education dollars from the state of Maryland. And as the future of Kerwin funding is crafted in Annapolis, we need to make sure that our local community knows what this funding can provide if allocated correctly. It would mean more services for our special education students, increased pre-K dollars, more funding for career and technology education, and more funding for teacher salaries. We all want our new teachers to become seasoned veteran teachers that see a sustainable career in education. This forum is a joint effort. I would like to thank Dr. Kane and our Board of Education for their support as we join stakeholders across our county and Maryland to make sure that we have a voice in the allocation of this very important funding formula. Thanks. Thank you for bringing it up. Dr. Kane, is the commissioners aware of that meeting? <coughs> oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually had a breakfast with commissioners and spoke about that. Thank you, Mrs. Fields. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to come forward? Okay. Thank you. Glad you got here on time. All right. Next item are our presentations. Mr. Pinder is the first one on inclement weather procedures, just as it started to get cold. <laughs> Good evening, uh, President Kelly, Vice President Harper, board members, and Dr. Kane. Um, for the record, my name is uh, Sid Pender. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. And each year, we have the opportunity to go through um, how decisions are made um, concerning if we're going to have a 90-minute delay, um, if school is going to be dismissed early due to inclement weather, or if we're not going to have school at all. And I will tell you, it is, it's not an easy decision. Um, it's probably the most stressful part of my job. And as I tell my two daughters, sometimes you're a zero and sometimes you're a hero. Um, so when school's canceled to my kids, I'm a hero. And when they gotta go to school, I'm that zero dad. So it's not easy uh, decision, but there's a lot of time and effort that goes into this. Um, and where we gather our information, we have AccuWeather where we, um, consult with actually a meteorologist that we could talk to on the phone that advises us of, you know, what their prediction is of the weather coming in. We look at the National Weather Service. We look at all the local media outlets, Channel 11, Channel 2, Channel 16. Um, we also use the Weather Channel, and we're in communication with the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. We also look at Weather Underground website to give us that information. Some of the different forecast models that we look at um, basically, you will see the five that we, we choose. 
um, the North American uh, model, the global forecast, the rapid update cycle, the rapid refresh, and the European one. And basically, when you look at the weather and you're talking about like a hurricane and you see all these squiggly lines going all over the place, those are different models. And all that is is a prediction. And we make our decision, and you'll see the timeline here in a few minutes. It's based on the information that we have at that current time. The weather will change. As we all know, we live right on the edge of the bay. As soon as it hits the bay, you could have snow up north and nothing down south. You could have fog on town and nothing up north. Um, what we're doing is in the morning around 3.30, we have um, John Murdoch, uh, Mary Dawkins, and Margaret Ellen Kamenovich that are at work. And they're beginning to call <coughs> the Maryland State Police Barrack to see if they're uh, noticing any um, weather on the roads because the troopers are out patrolling the roads at those times. We would contact the sheriff's office and talk to the duty sergeant to see what's occurring so we can get some insight from them. We also work closely with DES, uh, Department of Emergency Services, and then we, we discuss with uh, Public Works and also Parks and Rec. And going through this, the reason we're contacting Parks and Rec, they are the group that cleans our parking lots, our custodians assist them with shoveling the sidewalks, um, <coughs> But also, we're trying to figure out what time they're coming out in the morning. So if public works is not coming out until six o'clock in the morning, we're already behind schedule. So we, we talked to them the night before to get a feeling of, hey, are you starting at five? Or are you gonna come out at four? The State Highway Administration is out. And as you know, they're dumping salt everywhere. The county roads, all they're putting down is sand. And sometimes there's a little bit of a mixture of calcium in there, but for the most part, it's sand. Um, we do have Queen Anne's County uh, spotters. We have bus drivers, and I'll show you this in a few minutes, <clears throat> that are in different geographical regions around the county so that they can tell us what's occurring and ride around their area. Um, we uh, use the state highway traffic cameras, especially right now with the Bay Bridge. I think I'm kind of glued to it every morning, looking at it, monitoring the traffic. But we also use the exterior cameras of all the schools <coughs> to see if the sidewalks are clear. Uh, parking lots are clear and I also use the exterior cameras at Stevensville Middle School to kind of monitor the traffic on Route um, 18 going through there with the Bay Bridge to see how well that's flowing. So if you look up there or look at your laptop you'll see the different dots across the um, Queen Anne's County and like I said it's a very unique county because it goes all the way from the Chesapeake Bay to the Delaware line. Um, each of those dots is either where a road sensor is that gives us a temperature reading um, or we can do a visibility reading there. So in the morning, if it's foggy, you know, we might be getting a K to three mile visibility reading. It might be down to half a mile visibility reading. So we try to pick those locations where there's sensors and we can actually um, get that information back to us. Obviously, there's not going to be one in every part of the county. This is where we have our weather spotters. Um, they're bus drivers, county and um, contracted bus drivers that live in a di different geographical regions. And we contact them um, when we're expecting uh, snow, freezing rain, just to get out there at four o'clock in the morning and see what they're experiencing. Because a lot of times when you're talking to the state troopers or the deputies, somebody's definition of, hey, the road's not too bad might not be the same definition of, a, for me, of the roads not too bad. Um, so we like to get out and get a wealth of information to make this decision. Here's the timeline for how everything occurs. At 3.30 in the morning, that's when the transportation department starts gathering information every day. We like to make a decision by 4.40 in the morning. And some people go, well, hey, that's a little bit early. Um, we have a lot of students that start getting ready for school at five o'clock and believe it or not We've been able to work our first uh, where our first students board the bus. It used to be about 540 in the morning We've been able to cut that off and shave that off to six o'clock in the morning So we like to make that decision um, After we gather all the information I contact dr. Kane advise her. This is the decision we would like to go with um, You know, please move forward with us uh, when that decision is then made, um, it goes out at five o'clock, and I'll show you the different methods that we notify um, 
your parents and students. And then if you're looking at seven o'clock in the morning, everybody thinks, okay, well, if you do a 90 minute delay, you got a long time to wait. You, you really don't. By seven o'clock, you need to make a decision if you're going to close schools for the day because students start boarding the buses 30 minutes later. And once that process starts, there is no turning back um, because what you're gonna have, if you decide you wanna turn back, you're gonna have students standing there waiting for buses that are never coming. And you're also putting a lot of the students at risk to get injured um, by cars traveling up and down the road. It would be just a total nightmare to make that decision after um, those times that are allotted there. I'll say that probably the most stressful one is at 10 a.m. You have to make the decision if you're gonna close school early um, because of snow or freezing rain. And there's a lot that play into that, uh, plays into that. Mainly, you have to feed the students lunch for that day. Pre-K is pretty stressful because those students usually drive home on another bus at midday. Now all of a sudden, they're going to ride the bus that they came in on. Um, and that tends to be a challenge, making sure that they're getting on the bus. Also, you need to find out how many field trips you have occurring. Um, two years ago, we had some across the bridge, and I'm sorry, we're at Chesapeake College, and we were able to get them back in time. But you have to look at all that information. You have the CTE school, where you're transporting students from uh, Kent Island to Queen Anne's County High School. You have the fire school, and we also have our special needs buses that go across the bridge. Um, so at 11, I'm sorry, 10 o'clock, we make that decision. And just to kind of give you the normal times, at 11.30, the pre-K students leave those particular schools listed. I will say it's worked out very well, having Sullersville um, and Churchill be full day now, pre-K, so we don't have to deal with that issue during the daytime. Um, at 12 o'clock, <coughs> You can see where PM pre-K students begin to be picked up and brought into school. Um, 1 to 115, that's when pre-K begins for the schools listed. And then our first tier dismissals, Ken Island, Queen Anne's, Mattapeak Middle School, Sellersville Elementary School, Sellersville Middle, and Stevensville. <coughs> then we use those same buses to do the second tier dismissal. As I was mentioning earlier, you know, it's just not a simple, we're going to close school in the middle of the day. I forgot we have, I'm sorry, I have anchor points on there. I'm sorry, it's a rise now. Um, the fire school, we have the ninth grade annex. We have the uh, athletic events, and we, have, we also have the late buses that we have to coordinate with. How to receive notice of the decision being made. Most people have signed up for a school messenger. It's where a phone um, call goes out, a text or an email, and we can actually track how long that process takes and we can actually go back if a parent says, hey, it wasn't called at this number, we can go back, okay, it was tried at this particular time, or you're not registered on the program. Um, I wanna say, uh, don't quote me on this, but about eight to 10 minutes, I believe it is, and the whole process has, has gone through the first round. Um, we also use our website. Uh, we use the Facebook page, QAC TV. Um, we have the TV stations listed there, and then we have the radio stations that we put it on. Mr. Strait is kind enough to do our school <coughs> messenger, also our website and Facebook. And then I have um, the transportation department makes the phone calls to the TV stations and the radio station. And that part there is stressful because a lot of times you're either talking to a, um, an individual that might be their first time at the news station and they're asking you for a code, you give them the code and you say Queen Anne's County Public Schools, they may just put down Queen Anne's School. So you have to watch the TV to make sure they've entered the correct um, description of if it's closed or if it's 90 minutes. Code red and code blue, those are um, codes that we use when uh, school is canceled. Those are for employees. Code blue, you can use liberal leave. Essential employees still report to work. Code red, you can stay in bed and you know, the school was closed for central office staff. It's you know, too bad to get in. We get this question quite a bit, um, why schools are not open in zones. For instance, last year it seemed to be we were stuck in a pattern where it was only snowing from Churchill uh, up to Crumpton and there was nothing on Kent Island. Well, with the two-tier bus system, we um, 
use buses at Sellersville Middle School, Sellersville Elementary School, then for the second tier, they go to Churchill or they come to Centerville. Same thing on Kent Island, those buses do Kent Island. First tier, second tier, they also stay on Kent Island, but some of them come back to Graysonville and also um, Centerville. If we were to, able to do it in zones, we would have to get additional buses, which is a uh, pretty uh, financial, uh, big financial obligation. And other factors to consider, each day we have about 466 students to drive to school every day. And we're talking about st students that just began, um, they just got their learner's permit, I'm sorry, driver's license. And then we also have to rely upon Queen Anne's County Public Works, Centerville Public Works, and the State Highway. Like I said, the State Highway is out there 24 seven. It's the other groups that we have to rely on. What time are they coming out? Same thing with Parks and Rec. Um, if they're coming out at six o'clock, we're already behind the eight ball. Home, homes and business owners removing snow from the sidewalk, sidewalks. In the town of Centerville, I, I can tell you most of our students walk to the high school and you have to take that into account. Have the sidewalks been clear for them to get to the schools? That's another big issue they run into. Um, listed here are the school delay and closing uh, committee. Um, we meet once a year with um, parents, contracted bus drivers, principals, uh, board members, the Maryland State Police, the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department, um, Centerville PD, to try and just get a feel for how things went for that particular year. You always get the comment, well, why don't we do two hours? Why don't we do what, an hour? And I'll be honest with you, when you start separating it into just one hour and then you want to do two hours, Believe me, it gets very confusing because it's hard enough to know already when it's going to be 90 minutes delay, delay for time being picked up for the school bus. Um, we bring that question up every year just to see uh, if anybody has any different opinion on it, how they feel about it, and every year it seems to be they like the 90 minutes. Um, the other thing you'll hear is, well, if you get two hours, that gives you a little bit of extra dry time for the snow and all the melt. Half an hour is not that much for us. I mean, it really isn't. Listed below are the um, number of closings, early dismissals and delays that we've had. As you can see, there's no rhyme or reason. It is just that weather pattern that you get stuck in. Um, there for several years, um, usually it snows, it warms up and we're good to go. For the past several years, it's been, it snows, it stays below 32 degrees and we're stuck for a couple days. So as you can see, each year it's just a little bit different. So in conclusion, you know, I wanted to demonstrate all the information that is uh, taken in and relayed to us from various agencies. And again, it's not something that is just taken uh, lightly. It's a lot of thought put into it. And some days there's some very happy people and some days, you know, there's not you know, happy people. But I'll say this, the safety of the students come first, um, employees and bus drivers, and we try to always keep that um, in the back of our minds. Any questions or comments or concerns? My one comment would be, not this term, but previous term, I would get calls when they did shut it down, complaining, why did you, when, you know, the baby, it's a daycare problem. My 100% feeling is error on the side of safety. Mm -hmm. And you know, this plan, I think it's excellent. You got a tough job, and I'd rather see the schools 90 minutes late or closed than take a chance anytime, even though it might be an inconvenience for some parents because there is issues with daycare and kids being home, but safety's gotta be a primary issue when we're moving this many children in school buses. I mean, I, you know, I would back that up if it turned out to be an 80 degree day in February. Yeah, we, we we take that in consideration and we, if we can make a decision the night before we do, but that again is not an easy decision. I mean, if we know the temperature is going to be below like, you know, 32 and stay in the twenties and there's not been a whole lot of melting that day, well, that's an easy decision. Right. Let's just go ahead and call it so you can get, you know, a lot of back care. Rooms. But yeah, um, that doesn't occur every time. Right. So, and I've seen some counties call it the night before and nothing happens the next day. So at that. Yeah. <laughs> the fog's tough in Queen Anne's County because Sundersville and Canal are two different, Centerville, and, well, even close to rivers. Yep. Uh, 
can be Centerville can be fogged in. It can be nice in or Queenstown and vice versa. It's it's tough. It is tough. It's very Gary Fields isn't here. <laughs> Mr. Pinter, yes, um, 2013, 2014, wasn't that the really bad winter we had? And wasn't there like a pipe yeah. burst at was it Churchill? Churchill or, Elementary yeah, School. remember in the middle we of the were blizzard. sitting in this. We were sitting here freezing. Mm -hmm. I mean, great. talking about how our schools were closed. Yes, it was. Um, that was a tough winter. Yes, that was a Sunday night. I remember that well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Pinter. I, I wanted to be sure that we emphasize, that I'd like to emphasize to the parents that if you're watching, just remember 3.30 in the morning, the process starts to figure this out most of the time. A lot of work goes into that decision. So I hear a ton of complaints all the time. So if they don't understand, um, it, they can learn about it and to watch this on, t on the television. And if you hear about this and you get complaints from your, your friends, just remind them and let them know to get on here, watch this, this particular presentation. We give it every year at the beginning before the snow starts um, and, and just watch it and figure out what goes into it. You can see the hassle, um, the difficulty it is to make decisions for a, a county that spread this wide. If you go on our website and go into the transportation link, the um, information is all there of how the decisions are made. So we, we keep that posted and updated. Great, and and definitely uh, get on this the school messenger system. You, you know, it's it's hard to you know five o'clock in the morning to get a phone call, wake you up just to tell you you can go right back to sleep. But um, it's it's a great way to find out what's going on in the school for this and and other items too. Thank you, Mr. Penn. Thank you. Next presentation is Strategic Plan Goal 1, Learning Accountability and Results. Looking forward to this one. Good evening. Um, good evening, Captain Kelly, evening. Dr. Kane, members of the Board of Education, student members. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me the pleasure of presenting to you tonight um, on strategic plan goal number one, our academic indicator progress. Throughout the presentation, I'm going to welcome my colleagues to join me who um, are those content supervisors who will really be able to speak about those different areas in more depth after I review some of the data. So thank you again. And this just reviews the purpose of tonight. We're gonna to look at the various academic indicators and the progress from the previous 2018-19 school year. We're gonna also look at the results of the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, the MCAP. Um, last year was the last year of the park assessments, but really the whole system is now referred to as MCAP, so you'll be hearing that more and more. We will look into the district and school MCAP scores and reflect on successes and outline next steps. And I welcome you at any point through the presentation. Um, it's a lot of data. If you have feedback or ideas for next year, um, just I'm always open to ways to make things even more just clear for our families, our students. So I welcome any suggestions. This is very similar to the previous year format. But if you have a great idea as you're listening um, that you think, please don't hesitate to share it. And I will take some notes for next year. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about mathematics. And the first thing we're going to look at is we are going to look at the second grade math benchmark from 2019. So this is administered at the, like, towards the end of the school year. And the goal is that by the end of the 2021 school year, 90% of students in grade two will meet or exceed expectations. And so here you can really see that snapshot of how our schools performed. And then you can see overall the performance of all students in Queen Anne's County at the end at 92.6%.
Okay, and then on our next slide, we start to get into those MCAP results. So here it is broken down by grades three through five. And just as a reminder, when we're looking at the data from the MCAP, we're looking at this in terms of proficiency. So we're strictly looking at student, students who have met or exceeded the expectation, which is a level four or level five. There are five levels of performance that a student can earn on the assessment. Um, one thing I always like to just preface this with is that proficiency doesn't capture everything. So sometimes we do have students who make just profound growth, and it may not be captured in proficiency. You may have a student who the previous year scored at, let's say, a level one, and they make growth up to level three, which is fantastic. But because they haven't gotten to that level four, we may not see it. Um, and with the new accountability system for the state, they're really starting to look at that a bit more. So not only just looking at proficiency, but also looking at, but are students growing? Because we may not see everything here. And we'll be, I think, probably um, as, as Maryland, um, just as the state moves in that direction more, we'll be looking at data that way as well. So just kind of an interesting way. So here, uh, this chart captures grades three, four, and five. And this is not looking at the same group of students. So your grade three scores are looking at different years of students who took that grade three assessment. So we're looking at the achievement of students, but again, not um, that same group of students. However, if you, think about this in terms of trying to really follow a cohort of students, if you were to look at 2017-18 for grade three math, you'll notice that they scored 58.5% again in 2017-18. When they moved up to fourth graders, we see that go up to 59.5%. So it, you may not always see those things when you do the direct grade to grade comparison, but if you look at some of the dates and kind of play around with it that way, you can really see um, as students move to cohorts if they're going up or perhaps going down. And uh, similarly, so for grade four, if you look at that 2017-18, you can see fourth graders in 2017-18 were at 50.1% of proficiency. Um, but then by the time that cohort moved fifth grade, it, it increased to 52.8%. So even though looking at fifth grade, it looks like, wow, why is there that decrease there? If you're looking at it in terms of the same group of kids, there actually was an increase. Um, and, and conversely, when we look at grade four, you know, you see that big jump, which is wonderful, but it, again, it's not comparing the same group of kids. So I always like to just uh, point that out. Because like I see in grade four, 59.5, and then in grade five, okay, you don't have it for the next year, gotcha, okay. <coughs> okay. okay, oh, go ahead. Okay, and so on the next one, so now we have a breakdown of our schools. Um, you'll notice there are those purple circles. Um, and so that is basically just kind of hiding basically any data that we can't share to the public. We can look at all of that internally and our schools and our staff do as we go really, really deep when we analyze data, as we examine the instructional decisions that we made in the past and we continue to make um, to really make sure we're doing um, everything we can within our power to support our students. Um, but for the sake of sharing data with the public, if uh, there's an area that's less than 5% or greater than 95%, it's actually a confidentiality issue for students. So that's why there's those I thought they were kind of cute, but little cute purple dots there. Um, there's not much you can do in the data world to try to, you know, make it a little creative and fun, so. <laughs> Ravens is good. We like purple. Primary color tag. Yeah, you know, I tried to keep the color palette the same. You know, I, I actually mentioned that to Mr. Bell one day. You know, I thought he might appreciate that. Um, the, pri the privacy issue, to kind of yeah. clarify that, that the numbers are so small that Correct. some people may be able to figure out who that individual is yeah. in that grade. So. Especially as you start moving into our student group. So if you have a small student group and let's say, you know, 5%, um, less than 5% fell into a category or 90, it's, or the 95% really, that's when you can start to, you could start to maybe identify students. So we just always err on the side of caution. Um, but like I said, we have access to all of this data internally and we, you know, are able to go really deep, but for the purpose of sharing it with the public. Um, so again, this just gives a snapshot of our different schools and those levels that I discussed before are captured in the different colors with dark green being that level five and the lighter green being level four. So those are our two levels of students who are proficient. We also have the state rank um, up in the top right corner, which we discussed at last month's meeting too. 
discuss that? Do we have it from previous years? How has this been done over the last three or five years? Yeah, it has been. Um, and so we, we do. So you can look back into past years, and I also have most of it with me. So if you have any questions about, hey, you know, stop here for a second and let me know, has this increased? I'm, I'm happy to jump in and share that with you because I, I did bring that. A, you know, a, five, a little higher picture, but mm -hmm. this is good for each year, but then the, how we trend mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think probably for next year, I think it would be great to incorporate some of that and just look at usually about three years of trend growth is really helpful. And I can tell you just when you look at those overall district results, it stayed, I mean, roughly the same. It was about a decrease of a percentage point when you compare it to the year previous. And we're going to talk about that in a few slides because it's very interesting because it matches the state trend. Um, and I have a slide that I actually um, took from the State Board of Education presentation that you'll see in a few slides that I think make it really apparent that this is a statewide trend with mathematics. Um, it's not unique to us, um, but mathematics across the state is an area where um, we, we saw scores either stay the same or decrease, so. But also, if you have that trend data, you can also see where your, your the interventions are working, mm -hmm. or, yeah. or if they're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that is very helpful to the teachers and the, the supervisors. Yes. You know, are we spending our money wisely? Mm -hmm. And are the kids getting it? I mean, we talked about that, two, what, three years ago, Mr. P? I mean... Four years ago? Co correct. And, yeah. and uh, when Mrs. Pass and, and uh, Mrs. Walbert come up, and I know we've talked about it here with some of the, the interventions, the alignment that we've done uh, with READ 180, we've seen some significant growth in just one year. Um, and you're going to see that reflect uh, when we look at the ELA data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so continuing. And so now we move into grades six through eight. And so as you may know, so in eighth grade, some students take the eighth grade math assessment, but if they are enrolled in Algebra 1, they take the Algebra 1 math assessment. So you will really see that breakdown here. Um, you see your grade six results, grade seven, and then you can see the eighth grade math, the eighth grade algebra, which, which the proficiency is quite high. Um, and then that <coughs> final, final um, category puts everyone together. And that's actually part of one of our strategic goals really looks at eighth graders, regardless of which math course they're in and which assessment they make, because the proficiency is um, really tied to that. When, when our eighth grade algebra, it's great, it's really high. But are we taking our high flyers in that and the average child's not doing, average student's not doing that? Or is, or is, it, is it across the board with who's studying in the algebra class? Yeah, yeah, I mean, because when you take a look at that, and that's, you know, when you look at it across the state as well, okay. um, reaching uh, Algebra 1 by the 8th grade, yes, I think can see. Like class in, in mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with somebody that's not advanced, but more on that math. Thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you definitely can see the trend of this. I mean, I'm looking at sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade as years progress and there's definitely some decreases here mm -hmm. there are so that's where the interventions need to be discussed mm -hmm. but you would also expect this too you had said that the park was going to be a different you're assessment gonna, you're going to see a state you're going to see a state map uh, that's going to reflect what uh, mrs forbes was just referring to but we were warned about this and two years ago when this came in we were warned that they may not be as high because it's kind of like, this was like a benchmark. Well, now we're going into year, we're going into year five. So um, it's not. Okay. So we'll, yep. Let, okay. Let, hang on one second. Sorry. We're gonna, yep. I'm jumping, sorry. <laughs> and I think you might be referring to uh, the change from park to MCAP. Right. So yeah, and, and so this was the final year of park was administered in the spring. And then MCAP will be uh, administered this year. But I think anytime there's changes to assessments, you would expect there to be fluctuations, sometimes really high, sometimes lower. Um, it, it's, it's a really good point to bring up. So um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. OK, so continuing on. So uh, this captures our schools and including the Algebra 1. So you can really see where that proficiency um, is for all of our students. and. The state ranking is still listed there as well. And again, just kind of gives you that breakdown. 
And the next slide captures when we look at our grade three through eight and algebra one performance by student groups. And so um, for this one, because some of our student groups, um, based on the numbers, it helps us to see more data without having to hide as much data, essentially, because we can make the categories a bit bigger so that if you put your proficiency together instead of breaking it up into the five, it allows us to um, see that a bit better. And so um, you can see that overall performance of all students, but then really see where the achievement gap, um, where that achievement gap is. We did have some highlights. I know it's not showing here, but there are student groups who did make um, some growth that we're gonna highlight on the conclusion slide. And so while we recognize you know, the achievement gap exists and it's um, always at the forefront of what we do, and I think that every member of the CNI team just is so focused on that equity work and this really drives what we do. Um, but it's also important to look at while the gaps are big, we still wanna see that growth. We wanna start seeing those gaps narrow and get smaller and that is really um, a lot of the work um, that, that really drives um, many of us. And so we were really happy to see, and which again we'll highlight on the conclusion slide, but you'll see that our students with disabilities um, for special ed actually increased by 3.6%. English learners increased by 12.5% when we looked at proficiency, which is a yeah, big jump. Um, and so you know we wanna see those kind of things, but we also, um, like I said this very much, drives what we do, and, and this is the, the focus of the work is that piece around equity for all students. Okay, and so this, um, like I said, I took this slide directly from the State Board of Education presentation on August 27th, and I just felt like it was really important to conclude because I think it tells a story and it gives context to mathematic, the mathematics results. So this you know, reflects all of the counties in the state um, the counties that are highlighted in light gray pretty much stayed about the same, and counties that are in red or the dark red actually saw decreases. So across the state, um, for math three to eight, there was not one county that actually saw increases, which was just something that the State Board of Education has really been reflecting upon um, and, and spoke to at some of their meetings. So I think it just kind of speaks for itself. And nobody, everybody stayed equal or below, nobody excelled. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I think is surprising. Okay, and so the next slide moves us into the Algebra 1 test takers. So as our goal, actually, we look at the first time test takers. So we, um, our strategic plan, so when we get the data back, the state actually shares the data back just kind of as every student who took Algebra 1 and they let us know how everyone did. Um, our strategic plan, we, we really look at those first time. The first time you take that test, we want 80% of our kids um, you know, getting that level four or five. It should be noted to meet the graduation requirement. Um, it's actually a three, a four, or a five, but we really want students to be proficient. And so you can see based on this, there was a decrease um, for Algebra One. Again, different group of students. And so again, this is, um, and, and it was again similar, you know, statewide. Um, again, with the math, just the, the decreases that we saw. Just, mm -hmm. why, why would it? 14 to 15, 14, 15, why, what, is there anything, why there's such an increase there? Compared, I mean, everything else looks pretty level. But that one just seems to be a. That's a good question. Sure, that would have been, in the beginning when we made the transition to the new set of standards. So what you would expect to see is once teachers become more comfortable with the standards and they become more comfortable instructional strategies with the content to be able to deliver that, then you would start to naturally see as it gets implemented with fidelity, you would start to see some results. And so that's what we naturally see, you know, some kind of jump in the first few years. But as this indicates, we've kind of leveled off as you've seen across the state as well, where um, that everybody's trying to, go ahead. 14 was the first time it was put in and then everybody got on board with it, understood it, and then then it leveled off at some. And, and it was a significant shift. And I, and I often remind people at that time, 
r remember uh, what was happening is you had a you had the transition to a new set of standards, you had the transition to new assessments, you had transition to a uh, new teacher evaluation tool. Uh, those were external factors. Now you now you put in uh, the implementation of new technology. So when you have a factor of external change and internal change, that's a lot. When you think about what we've asked classroom teachers to do, it's it's monumental, uh, and they've done a phenomenal job. Uh, and and part of that was, you know, many of the reform initiatives of race to the top uh, that we were required to implement. So some of that you expect over time to see, you know, as folks get more comfortable, things will start to progress. And but then it's some. I mean, it, it seems like to me every time some kind of testing slips in, after three or four years, somebody changes some metrics of it, and it, you can't use the four year ago. It's just, and everything changes. I mean, technology changes, methods change. So it's that you're not apples and apples, apples and oranges. But it just seems like it's hard to sit there and say where we were five years ago compared to where we are today and be realistic about it with what's changed. And, 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 and that becomes a challenge when, when things constantly change, um, you know, for teachers to feel comfortable with the standards. And, and that's really, uh, and, and Mrs. Smith could speak more to that. When we talk about Algebra 1, and even though it's, it's going to be some of the same standards or some, you know, with the test being a little bit more adaptive, um, it's another change. Uh, so, um, so we shall see. I know we invent the wheel and it gets better, but sometimes I wonder at what cost do we sit there and just keep changing things because teachers have to change. And it's, I mean, it's constant. I mean, I don't know how they do it sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's quite fascinating. If you look at the research around this area, it's, it's, we need to put maybe a halt to, um, you know, the amount of reforms that we're asking school districts and, and schools and individual teachers to implement it at one time. Fascinating and commendable. I'm sorry? Fascinating and commendable to the people who are having to do this. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. And I think when you frame it from federal, state, to local, and then you put local change into that as well, um, it's daunting. Our principals, our, our leaders, our, our teachers, it is a constant team effort. Um, to be able to implement a variety of initiatives, a variety of uh, uh, strategies uh, with consistency and with fidelity. I mean, it's always my idea. The engineers have to change the oil in the car. The mechanics should design it. But the teachers should have, I hope they have enough say in how they, some of this comes on because it's easy to mandate stuff and tell them how to do something, but to implement it is sometimes in the real world. Yes, and at our last state briefing, uh, I know that as we're making some changes that they want to include more Maryland educators that are continuing to be involved in the process. Good to hear. Okay. And uh, moving on to the next slide. So this one, again, we're still looking at Algebra 1, and then this just captures that comparison um, school to school. You can see students who are taking Algebra 1 in middle school or doing quite well on the assessment. Um, and then we can see how our students are doing in high school. And then uh, you can kind of see just district wide. So again, captures what we looked at before. Well, I have a question on that. Um, so the purples to the right, these are like only a few numbers of really yeah. outstanding. Yeah, less than 5%. Mm -hmm. And some of them were really close, but officially if it's you know, 4.99, 4.9. Um, but yes, that's correct. So that means in that upper level five category, there were less than 5%. And I don't think it's fair to compare this to, to a middle school eighth graders, mm -hmm. you know, just for exactly the reason yep. that Mr. Smith said. Those mm -hmm. are already your high flyers because they wouldn't even be taking that class right. if they weren't uh, one yeah, of the I high mean, flyers. Compare middle school to high school mm -hmm. when you're taking be like taking a professional baseball player playing with high school. I mean, you're a different level. Yeah, but I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's the the student that goes into the eighth grade taking all, algebra. The, that is unusual for people yeah, to take right. algebra in eighth grade, but it's normal for them to take it in high school. The, right. What about Everybody the, takes it in high school. What about the students right. who have it in seventh grade? We don't have any data on that. No, but I'm just saying mm -hmm. it's the same thing. We had we've had students mm -hmm. take. We have. Yeah. We didn't uh, have any this year though, right? In this, in this data, I don't see any. Not in this data because it was such a small group. Um, but I, okay. 
want to say maybe there was, yeah, just a very small number. Has been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, the difference between middle school, don't they take it all year and high school is a semester? Yes. I believe the high school that has the true. block schedule, so. That's exactly right. Yep. So our, our math supervisor is on her way. Yes uh, and no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there are some students who take a full year, yeah. a few, but for the most part, they are on a semester. But Ms. Smith, welcome to the table. Good evening, Hi. Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, board members, and student board members. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Amy Smith. I'm the new mathematics supervisor and truly am honored to be part of this county. Um, it's been a joy already to be around in so many of the schools and working with the principals, working with the teachers, and working with our students, because we have some lovely students. So the algebra question, most of our students in ninth grade, if they're in ninth grade, they are taking algebra one for a full year. Some of them are taking it for a full year for 45 minutes. Some of them are taking it full year in 90 minute blocks. So they're getting algebra one and then a support class if they are uh, struggling student with uh, different different capacities. Um, a lot of them were coming out of their MCAP math eight and they were scoring ones or twos. And that's what helped decide for them to go into that full year 90, block, 90 minute block. <clears throat> the students that are only taking algebra one in a semester are generally the students that are ones that either passed their algebra one course but did not make the MCAP score that they needed in order to meet their graduation requirement. So they're getting um, algebra skills based around the bridge plan so that they have a second opportunity to take their now MCAP before it would have been the park to take their MCAP for their second time. And if they're successful, they're done, we're set. And if not, then they have their bridge plan already in place so that they can get their endorsements to be able to get their diploma. And Mrs. Smith brought up something great that I want to point out here too. So uh, keep in mind to meet the graduation requirement. It doesn't just look at proficiency. It looks um, at a score of 725, which is actually level three. So if you look at students the first time who scored, so pretty much starting in that yellow band, you can see it's actually a good amount of students who are meeting the graduation requirement. They may not be proficient yet, um, but they are meeting that graduation requirement. So thank you for making me think of that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so now this next slide shows us the Algebra 1 breakdown um, by student groups. And so again, we can see where our achievement gaps are, um, and, and really this helps us to just set goals for ourselves and um, re really work at looking at concrete ways we can change these numbers and again look for growth because the ultimate goal is to narrow all of these gaps. Um, and again, it's always at the forefront of what we do. What, I wonder why you didn't separate the level threes because that would give us an idea. Sure. Mm -hmm. They've actually yep. made their graduation requirement. That's a great, yep, that's a great point. And um, I'll incorporate that next year. And it is something that's available online. And if you'd like, I could add it to a Friday, I'm sorry, the, the weekly update. So, and keep sure some of that data. Yeah, I'm interested sure. in the mm -hmm. graduation requirement issue. The other thing, yeah. I go back to grades three to eight, algebra one, I see Asian and I don't see Asian on this one. Um, you know, it depends on the size of the cohort. So year to year, it can really fluctuate. So on, because grades three through eight capture so many students in the band, we had enough students. Um, we can only share the data if there are 10 or more students in the cohort, but because this is limited to essentially eighth or, or ninth grade, um, that cohort of students was not large enough that we could share it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now the conclusion. So I'm going to highlight the analysis and then I will hand it over to Mrs. Smith. Um, and actually the other Mrs. Smith will be joining us too to talk about our students with disabilities. Um, so again, just some highlights, which I, I feel like we've already covered a lot of this. Um, so again, when you kind of look at mathematics for grades three through eight, the four and five scores decreased by approximately 1%, which was very similar to that statewide trend, um, similar to the other counties. 
we saw the grades had increases, I did want to highlight that our students with IEPs increased 3.6%. And I did want to add that when you look at overall the number of our African American students who took Algebra 1, so not just looking at the first time test takers, there was an increase there of 2%. And so I wanted to highlight that because it was also highlighted um, by the Maryland State Board of Education at one of their recent meetings. And so now I will hand it over to the math Mrs. Smith first and then um, so some of the strengths and areas that we've seen really helping growth was our implementation of the number talks at the elementary level. Um, K-2-5 in most of the schools is now doing five days of number talks. And what number talks is, is, is an opportunity for students to really work on skills that help develop their fluency, but they talk about how they're figuring their mathematics. And so students get to talk about their strategy, why they did what they did, how they did it, and looking at lots of different fashions. So now students, particularly our EL students, are hearing many different strategies and different opportunity times and getting that community sense of how we talk about math and how we actually script what our thinking is. So they're building that modeling and reasoning, but what we've actually seen was an increase in our EL students' proficiency, and I credit a lot of that to that continuing build of that number of talks, particularly at the elementary level. We have now moved that into also our, high, our middle school level, and so students are getting that continued experience of strategy conversations, and we're really seeing growth in how students are expressing their thinking and their reasoning mathematically. The elementary and middle school math specialist has been a critical part to growth in our areas. They provide wonderful, rich, professional learning for the teachers. They're supporting them in their collaborative planning times. They're supporting them with strategies to really help build students' understanding so that they're understanding the math at their concrete level before they go into just the algorithm of follow a process and simplifying or solving an answer. Do the math is our intervention piece that we're using. We ha did see some gains in our special education, but also in just some of our struggling learners, we've seen growth in their levels overall when you start to break down and look student by student versus just the large cohort. So that intervention strategy and structures within our elementary and middle schools is really helping to support and move forward all of those students. The curriculum writing in the summer was a phenomenal experience. Um, I came in right after it was all done, so I got to see the end products, the model lessons, the additional resources that have been added to the curriculum to support the teachers in their instructional practice is really a key feature so that we're putting in very strategic lessons and strategies for how students learn their mathematics to grow that understanding and really develop that communication and reasoning piece, which is the, one of the largest areas that dr drill down to the scores that the students are getting their three, fours, and fives on throughout. Is this in addition to the Agile Mind? Are we still using Agile Mind? Or so Agile like Minds is used from grade six up through the Algebra two coursing. That's really the text resource for the students. It's not the curriculum, it's their resource of how they receive practice, some of the different learning strategies and um, video helps to actually see some of the mathematical concepts movement and trace throughout. But in the elementary school, that's, that's not the source there. They still are using um, their Envision math resources that they had in prior years, plus a lot of the illustrated mathematics and achieve the core model lessons are built into the curriculum to support all of the standards. Good evening, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, board members. Um, for the record, my name is Jolene Smith, no relation. <laughs> um, I am the supervisor of special education, um, and I am very excited to be here speaking to you. I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that our students have performed and um, really attribute that to kind of the way that we have approached our special education this year. Um, we have, you know, we recognize the value in all of our teachers, but we also recognize that we have a very unique skill set when we look at our IEP chairs. 
Uh, so we have done a lot of work uh, in terms of coaching and using our IEP chairs in, in the form of coaches um, to really focus on things such as specially designed instruction, defining what that is, what it looks like, um, going into different classrooms and observing so that we can give some very um, useful feedback to the teachers that are in the classroom, both general and special educators. Um, in addition to that, we're going to continue this year to work on differentiation and really defining some of those co-teaching models. Um, co-teaching is not something that is new, but we are looking at it from a different lens. And now we're looking at it from the lens of co-development, co-implementation, and co-assessment. So that we're kind of looking at it from a three-tiered approach and really that integration of the general educator and the special educator together as experts in their field in different, in different lights, um, but really marrying the two so that we get a very comprehensive approach to mathematics and really instruction as a whole. just a few of our next steps so that you know where we're going as a mathematics office. We're looking at ways to be able to offer teachers some professional learning experiences to use a, more of the hands-on manipulatives within their classroom. Um, Mr. Paluski and I have been working to kind of implement virtual PD to say to give opportunities for teachers to actually log in after school time so that we can collaborate together, but really have some experiences to learn about some different strategies to help support students in their learning. And so those will be implemented at the tail end of fall and then we'll probably try another one in the winter as well. My focus right now is around math eight and algebra one. Math 8, because as you saw in the data, the students that are in the Math 8 cohort are really our struggling most learners. So we need to find some other strategies to help support them as they get into Algebra 1, because that's the state test that is deemed for them for their graduation. So we're working out those pieces, and I'm excited to actually work with teachers that way because I think it'll give them an opportunity for some other professional learning. They're hungry for it and they're willing for it and they're kind of restricted right now as trying to get everybody together. And so they seem to be very responsive about being able to log in from home at six o'clock and we can go and have some professional learning online um, and working out some other ways to have some videos and I need this experience and they can tap into their resources and be able to see a quick five to 10 minute video about how to use a resource, how to engage the students with the math and grow them through some of those learning gaps that may exist. The other part is to continue that number talks I talked about earlier and really moving it into a DNA place in our middle school because it's pretty much there in elementary school. The students are talking it throughout mathematics class and moving that so that that feel is in our elementary, but also moving it into algebra one. Because while our students are in high school taking algebra one, they need to be able to communicate their strategies and be able to express them so that when it comes to an assessment, they can actually put it into writing as well. And um, I think that covers all of it. And um, I can actually add just one little bit too about STAR 360. So STAR 360, um, beginning this year, we have been screening all of our elementary and middle school students in English and math, and we are almost done with the window, and we have gathered some really, really great beginning of the year diagnostic data, and we're bringing our teacher specialists together on October 22nd, so coming really soon, to dive into that data. It's really, really fascinating um, because it breaks down student skill gaps into the actual standards, which as students get older, this, those skill gaps just really differ student to student. So it's giving a lot of information to our teachers. So we're working on really making sure they understand how to use those tools and they can continue to use that to progress monitor students throughout the year. So I think it's a really exciting thing that we're just starting right away with um, to start gathering that data and, and already have it coming in to, to help support our students further. Great, and thank you. And I think we are ready to move on to English language arts. Thank you, Mrs. and Miss, Mrs. Smiths. <laughs> okay, and Mrs. Walbert, Ms. Palson, all going to join me. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Canton. Good evening. Good evening, Captain Kelly, members of the board, student members, 
For the record, I'm Bridget Passon, English Language Arts Supervisor, grades three through eight. Good evening, everyone. Um, for the record, Susan Walbert, um, Supervisor of Early Learning, Title I, Title III, and Migrant Education. And I'm Julie Smith, Supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in case we have any late joiners watching the meeting. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about the grade two English language arts benchmark test, which is uh, similar to what we spoke about with math. So again, that goal is that 90% of students in grade two will meet or exceed expectations on that end of the year assessment. And so you can see um, the varying schools and how students performed on that this year. And overall, 75.8% of second graders in the spring um, showed that proficiency. And moving into those MCAP park scores. So again, the goal for this is that 75% of students in each grade level from three to eight will be designated um, as, again, that level four or five. And so you can really see how students did. One thing I'd like to highlight that if you wanna at some point later on, get your pen out and start comparing, again, looking at the cohorts. When we look at actually grades three through eight, um, I believe it was, I just, when you look at it as terms of the cohort, you see this nice staircase. So as students are going from grade to grade, they're all, they're consistently making growth. And so you really see that with English language arts. Um, if you look at, compare grades, so third graders in 2017-18, when they became fourth graders, in 2018-19, um, that jump was 50.6% to 57.2. That's pretty significant. And fourth graders in 2017-18, when they moved uh, to fifth grade, 53.6% to 56.8. So just to point that out, um, you don't always see that again in those grade to grade comparisons. On the next slide, we have again a snapshot just district wide and then also of our schools. And so overall, uh, it was 54.9% of students in grades three through five were proficient in English language arts, which was a slight increase of 0.6%. And we'll see other increases throughout English because that's really the trend with English. Um, and when you look at grades three through eight overall, it was actually a 2.8% increase year to year. So really nice growth there. On the English charts for grades two to five, I don't see all elementary schools. It's Oh, um, that is because not all of our elementary schools have grade two. Um, and gotcha. I'm, yeah. Canard and um, gotcha. Bayside. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And thank you for pointing that out for the public too. It'd be good to, I can add a text to, for that next year. Um, okay, and so moving on. So now this one captures uh, grades six through eight. And again, I'm just gonna highlight some of that cohort data. So if you were to jump back and look at fifth grade from 2017, 18, it's a 58.8% which moved up to 61.6% when those students became sixth graders. Sixth to seventh, this one was quite significant, 49.8% up to 60.8. So that's, that's a nice jump. And then when you look at seventh graders, as they moved on to be eighth graders, it went from 63.1% to 67.6%. So again, just kind of across the board in those grade levels, you're just, as students are getting older and progressing, that proficiency just keeps growing, which is what we wanna see. Um, and we get really excited when we see it. Just a quick question where mm -hmm. um, overall we're looking at the goals. We've set that 75%. Mm -hmm. I remember when we set those goals, mm -hmm. uh, not to me mess things up to look at trends, but I mean, are we revisiting some of those goals at a, a point so that we strive higher maybe in the future? I'm not sure where we get those from and if we're gonna keep them that way. Mm -hmm. I can go, uh you can go. So, you know, we're getting ready to change assessments again. So, <laughs> so, you know, we may have a reset, but for right now, as we work on the strategic plan, we, we've kept this goal. Yeah, where we are, but when we change assessments, might be. If you feel there's a need to change it. Right. I mean. Is that, we're gonna do that or the state's doing that? The MCAP is statewide. Okay, so mm -hmm. the state's. Oh, so they set these. They set the benchmark. We set we set they our set strategic goal. We set, goal. Correct. Right. Yeah, we set our strategic goal right. based on. They're going to do a different assessment. They're going to do it just like you talked about in math. They're right. So, when the when the assessment changes, you know, we sometimes, as you saw that thirteen fourteen data, see a drop, right. right? So sometimes that happens. So we may need to reset. We've left our goal as it is um, for this point, but you notice it's by twenty twenty one. So we're going to have to reset anyway. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, grades six through eight were really where we saw some just significant, significant growth. Um, and I know you don't see it here, but if you were to look at the proficiency from all of our schools last year, every single one um, for grades six through eight is on increase. So, and I'll just share that those statistics with you because they're great to know. So, Sudlersville Middle School increased by four percent, Stevensville Middle by ten point one percent, Mattapique Middle by 0.4, Centerville Middle three point one. Um, and then overall, as a school district, last year we were at 58.3% proficient for these grades, and that moved up to 63.3. And you can really see that reflected in both the state and the Eastern Shore rankings. I mean, okay. there's a lot of ones. So who's number one in the seventh grade? What, what county was above us? It's usually <laughs> Worcester usually beats us. Yeah. If anybody's going to beat us on the shore, it's Worcester. True. Hey, more money. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I, can, I didn't say that I, out loud. I can look it up. I'll look it up later because I have it with me. I I I'm not bitter. <laughs> We're going to get them next year. <laughs> um, okay, so continuing. Good question. Good question. Okay, and so. Now we're looking at grades three through eight and we're looking at proficiency in terms of student groups. And, and again, I always like to say, you know, we're, we are aware of our achievement gap and again, it drives what we do. However, we want to see growth. That is always the, the goal is that we see growth and we begin to narrow that. And again, um, if you were to look at the proficiency, every single student group that is highlighted here increased when you compare it to last year. So every single student group saw growth. Um, and, and some was quite significant, which you'll see highlighted on the additional slides, so on the conclusion slide. So again, just while we will never be satisfied until these gaps are eliminated, we are happy when we can see growth um, and we will continue to, to move in that direction. Um, we do, I do like what you said you will try to reflect next year, which is, is that growth, because mm -hmm. that's, that's relevant information for us. I think us. so too. More yeah. relevant. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and we will have that next year. Um, okay, and if you move to this next slide, so similar to math, we wanted to capture um, what was going on statewide. So you can see we're always happy to be in the green. Um, and, and again, statewide trend with English language arts that, you know, there's a lot of just really exciting stuff going on. Um, and, and so you can see that trend statewide, really. And, but there were some counties who, who remained relatively the same, but we were right up there with the countries, uh, with the countries, with the counties uh, making growth. <laughs> the majority, of the majority of the counties increased. Mm -hmm. Yes. All Western Shore except a few Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. A neighbor's a sick new, a brand new sixth grader, and he keeps telling me how he doesn't like, and you know, English language arts doesn't want to read. I said, well, when you get your job as a fireman and you have to hook the hose up, you need to read the manual in order mm -hmm. to do it. Oh. <laughs> the light bulb went on. Yeah, I'm trying to put it in real life terms. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You have to know exactly how much of it you're supposed to twist. Right. Okay, and so now moving into grade 10. So again, we look at those first time test takers. And this one does capture um, over time. And we did see a decrease in this area. Again, this shows you proficiency, <laughs> um, but it's that score of 725, which is that level three or above that meets the graduation requirement. So there was that dip for English 10. Again, we're comparing different groups of kids every year. And so then this next slide captures our- You see a increase term. or decrease of two or three percent. Can that be almost given to the fact that different, some groups of mm -hmm. classes, I mean, yeah. we can, what we're doing is good and we're going up, but 2% down is not necessarily we're doing bad and 2% right. up is not necessarily we're doing something real different. It's just that the groups change and mm -hmm. that statistical difference. Yeah, you have it exactly right. We're comparing completely different groups of students. And so different students, if we were to establish a baseline, are gonna come in with different skills and different areas and just year to year that can differ. So that is always um, that piece when we do that direct comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 2% can really be, you know, and, and actually like, again, within that cohort of student, there actually could have been growth but when we're comparing two different groups of students, you may not see it, so. Well, my daughter always liked to say, some of the people that, on that good day that's given, they could have, half of them could have had the mm -hmm. flu. Yeah. Half of them good. aren't good takers. You know, uh -huh. these, these formatted, formative tests, they, they freeze up when they have to take these kind of tests. Mm -hmm. So there are so many external Variable. factors that we can't even take into consideration. Mm. Absolutely. For a 2% decrease, it, Again, half the class could have all have been sick. That could mm -hmm. both ways. I'm not saying. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, they could have all. It could have been a sunny day, and 
<laughs> they were distracted. They were distracted. And, I mean, the, you have to take, you know, yeah, see it from a bigger picture than just. Yeah, it's it's one measure. You know, a, right. a state assessment, I'm the, I was joke, I'm the test lady, and I'll say it's one measure, <laughs> it's one day. Um, you know, and it doesn't capture everything. And I always recommend that when we're making high stakes decisions and, and we look at multiple measures, because right. one day of one test, we've all been there. I mean, we all are allowed to retake that driver's license exam. They don't put on our license you know, failed the driver's license times, exam so. 10 times, <laughs> you just get your license. Right. Um, and, and so, yeah, exactly. It is It is one day in time. And, and for different students, not all students perform well in assessment, but they know the information. And so um, it's, I, I appreciate you pointing that out. So. And there's yeah. no way to capture that except oh. on a bridge project. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and mm -hmm. if they come in from a different school, they, as I understand it, they get the 725, so they're able to credit for the high school graduation but maybe they could have performed higher but they automatically get the 720 yeah if they're out of state mm -hmm. if they're out of state there's different requirements out, out based of, on when they out come out of the school system right? yeah mm -hmm. okay and, and yes it was confirming Worcester oh <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> okay however don't we were jealous. about double what our oh, yeah, other yeah, yeah. eastern shore oh yeah <laughs> Not that we're Thank competitive. Thank you for confirming. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was. I'm always after them. I always have to be bitter. They were gray on that map. They were. Oh. Not green. Thank you for pointing that yeah. out. Mm -hmm. I can go back to it. <laughs> okay. And so <laughs> moving on to um, just, again, the school breakdown. And then, again, looking at. But, again, if you really think about those yellow bars, students the first time taking the test we do have a lot of students who are just meeting that graduation requirement with um, that assessment the first time really quite the majority and so even if you were to you know look at that countywide it's 85.7 percent of kids are meeting the graduation requirement the first time they take that assessment so that's that's great it's encouraging yeah it's very encouraging um and we'll have some college career uh indicators that we're going to look at towards the end we're getting there um that i think actually just give a beautiful picture of by the time students graduate how well-rounded they are and how much they have achieved which again you may not capture it in one test but when you look at that college career readiness indicator data and how much growth we've seen over time it's just really impressive that kids are getting exposed to a lot of different ways to show their proficiency in different areas and where they're going to go thrive as adults um, and, and contribute to our community um, i know we I probably and it's going to cost money so we probably can't do it <laughs> but you see kids ready for college and don't get me wrong, when you go from high school to college, a lot in your life changes. But how many of our students, you know, are in college, ready for college, and, and do it in four years? Do we ever track that or? A data exists. I think it's the clearinghouse, right? The clearinghouse data? We, we do. Uh, and we'll be happy to provide that for no, you. No, I'm not, I mean, I don't know how it is, but I just wonder, and how do you, I mean, it, once they go away, they might be in. Maryland, we had a right. tracking on that. We started that back in 2013, 14. We started. So we do have something to show where it There was tracking done then. Because that shows success of what we've done. Sure. Of what at they've done. The, <laughs> at least yeah. the students. What we've done and contact. they've done together. Right. Yeah. At, least, at least you get the ones that you can get a hold right. of. Well, that's right. what I mean. That's then, you know, then it's, right. you know. When we started doing that years ago, we started doing that. I don't know if we still do. It was 2012 or 2013. And I, I, I can think of about 15, 16. There's a slide somewhere that I can find where it's got Had some of that information. That. Where you see about three quarters of those students that are going off to either a four year or a two year institution. And then it's broken down from there when you get into military, going into the workforce. Actually, I think I know exactly where that is. There's something interesting. <laughs> okay, and then this final Have slide. Have a beer and we'll look at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then this final slide captures our student group data. And so again, um, you know, we, we really see where those, those gaps exist. Um, but I will say in different areas in English language arts, they're not as profound in certain areas. So we're starting to kind of see that leveling off, um, which is great. Uh, so we want to see, and again, just constant improvement over time. And now for the conclusions, um, so I'll just quickly Again, most of the analysis we've already talked about. A few highlights, though. Again, our Hispanic and Latino students increased by 6% in grades 3 through 8. English learners, 9.4%. And again, our student with IEPs increased here as well with 3.8%. So that's great. Um, and English 10, again, if you look at those first-time test takers, we had over 85% who met the graduation requirement. And I will hand it off to my colleagues who will talk a little bit about the areas of strengths and uh, the next steps. 
first just wanted to give a little shout out for our little people, our pre-K to two. Mm -hmm. Much of the data is not really reflective of, of them because it's not a you know state. There is, there's no state assessment until they get to third grade. But just wanted to um, really pay attention to what our uh, pre-K to two teachers are doing to build the foundation prior to this. We're working really hard responding to Senate Bill 734, which I'm sure that you've heard, which is requiring us to screen all of our kindergarten students and then provide those students that are showing some kind of need in reading with a systematic, um, explicit, um, evidence-based program so or instruction. So we're really working hard to embrace that. And then also our um, educational equity COMAR regs that just passed that um, <coughs> there's a statement in there that says all of our second graders should be reading on level by the end of second grade. Um, so that's a pretty big hill, but we're, we're climbing it and, and we are working really hard to build all, that foundation. All of second grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a... It's a big one, but we're, we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. That's we're gonna, ambitious. We're going to die trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so lots to celebrate. Uh, in all grades three through ten we came in in the top third in the state in a lot of instances you saw where we were number one on the shore um, and we know who we're chasing where we weren't uh, number one I've shared with that county that we're chasing them so everybody's um, aware uh, our areas of strength come with uh, first and foremost with curriculum development last summer summer 2018 um, we were able to gather teams to craft curriculum for grades five, um, grades six, both standard and advanced, um, and English one, both standard and honors. Um, and we're able to implement those last year. Um, we monitored those by collecting and reviewing student composition folders. Um, and all of our RELA, ELA, um, high school English teachers um, were willing to give us a survey of their composition folders so we could see what was going really well with assessing our students' ability to critically, to critically read um, and put it into well-written responses. Uh, we were able to determine great strengths. Um, our teachers are not only following the curriculum, um, but doing it with fidelity. They're building in those pre-writing pieces that link the reading that the students have done in the unit to the writing assessment. Um, they were using the park rubrics and now we'll use the MCAP rubrics to score and provide feedback so that our students have exposure to the expectations before that testing day. Um, so that was all looking great where we saw that we needed to better support our teachers um, by looking at those composition folders was that really important area where um, the, the work is reviewed peer review or teacher workshops um, to look at the writing and help students improve so we've been working to create professional development to that end to better support teachers there Coincidentally, um, we had a great opportunity to take an entire team to Houston, Texas last November to the National Council for Teachers of English Conference. Um, in most cases, it was the reading specialists and the English chairs. Um, in turn, when we came back from that, we created professional development linked to um, raising student voice, improving student student discourse via um, writing lessons, um, more analytical reading opportunities, so all those things kind of came together, all those different initiatives, the curriculum writing we were doing, the curriculum monitoring we were doing, the professional <coughs> development that we um, attended last fall and were able to bring back to our teachers last winter, um, certainly supported um, our teachers in moving our scores and helping our students and helping all students, all student groups. Um, Along with that, we also last year was um, our first year for system-wide reading interventions. We implemented uh, System 44 and Read 180 in grades three through eight. Uh, at our last reading specialist meeting, our reading specialist dug into that data. Um, while we can't prove causality, we looked for correlations between students enrolled in interventions um, and their park scores. Um, and we found in this first year in this baseline data that a third of our students enrolled in reading interventions increased by one or more level on park. Um, so that is really significant growth for the first year of new reading, uh, new reading interventions. 
So we're really excited about that. And I hope that next year, um, hopefully I'm sitting here and reporting out to you again, but that I'm able to show you, I will show you comparative data and I hope we see it trending upward. Um, but they, they spend an hour and a half um, looking and comparing and, and doing math, which region specialists in there, uh, supervisors don't love doing, but we had our calculators and, and it actually was a lot of fun and it was really critical to be able to see. It was good for you. <laughs> it was, Miss Harper, it certainly was. Um, and it was able to, to lend itself. It's the other side of the brain. Yes, so hard. Um, to have great conversations about it and what, and what we need to do. So I, you know, I think we were able to put reading specialists back in front of kids um, as the lead in those interventions and I think and I thank our principals for that um, because that makes a world of a world of difference um, all the while these reading specialists are out there do you know supporting the curriculum monitoring and the professional development so so lots of different hats that they wear in a seven hour time span um, but we're really grateful to have them and to have the support um, of the principals Ms. Pass and I do have a question um, sure I do get a lot of complaints um, about writing, the sure. inability of students to write. I know they have fabu fabulous reading interventions. Maybe I missed your discussion. Like, how does that relate to them actually writing, like writing an essay? Um, I'm so talking about some high school kids. Talking about high school kids? Yeah, the, yes. So and overall, the curriculum development that we've done over the course of the past three years has built in four units with four major writing assessments at the end. Um, what we're doing now is making sure that we're supporting the overall writing process in grades three through 12, so that they're not just coming in one day, writing for 45 minutes, and that's it. That they're doing the pre-writing, that they're doing the rough draft, that they're having these peer review conversations, or we're encouraging our teachers to have these one-on-one -on -one student conferences looking at the writing um, and giving them targeted feedback to improve their writing. So all of that is a, is a work in progress. And that co those composition folders that we're collecting are showing that, that our teachers are working hard to do it. Um, it shows up in the reading interventions as well. Writing and writing opportunities show up in the reading um, interventions. Um, typically, once a week, uh, not as long as they might in our tier one classes, but there's added opportunities there for writing. And I've heard a lot of um, informal conversations when, when, uh, when my reading specialists are able to turn and talk. You know, I think they might talk about weekend plans, but they're talking about the connections they're seeing between what students are doing and learning about in their interventions and how it's carrying over into tier one. Um, and writing was certainly a concern that, that teachers were noting on feedback forms that they needed more support with. Um, and, and we're aware and it's coming because because I'm, I'm aware of those issues and we, we want to make it a more enjoyable experience um, and a more relevant experience so that they are college or career ready. Correct. It can be both when it comes to writing, that's for sure. Pardon me? Both college and careers. Yes. Writing is it's important for yep, all that. Absolutely. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. So in the world of special education, um, and specifically in the area of ELA, we're using a lot of the same strategies that I spoke to um, when I was addressing math, which is really, again, that job embedded, the coaching, um, the focus on specially designed instruction. What we're doing a little bit more so in the English language arts area is really refining the scope of the IEP goals and addressing, I mean, we're doing this in math as well, but we've been working very, very much on looking at those skill deficits and instead of having these broad lofty goals and more specific objectives, really tailor it, the goal itself to the area of need so that we are addressing those gaps from the beginning and working our way back up to that grade aligned standard. Um, we also uh, participated in expanding our intervention opportunities um, so that we we did a system-wide rollout for all of our special educators this um, August uh, with the Spire reading intervention, which is um, more of an Orton Gillingham based reading intervention. Um, it aligns very nicely because there it's also um, multifaceted when instructionally it, it's a 10 step process and it's just another way for our students that may not be um, you know grasping the concepts with one intervention to have a different opportunity as well. 
Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't speak to the fact that, you know, our MSAA data has not been tallied and, and tabulated just yet, but we've also expanded our focus in the areas of all of our students to really make sure that our special educators understand that there's a large emphasis on reading and writing um, in, in all classrooms, be it an inclusive setting, um, diploma bound students, certificate bound students, whatever the case may be, it's very much an area of emphasis. And this is something that we're, we're continuing to really focus on and make sure that everyone is focusing on that as well. So we're not using any interventions that are like cookie cutter where everybody has to have the same kind of intervention. I mean, you're actually Correct. tailoring it, like you said, to the students who I mean, pinpoint down to it's, you know, it's fluency or it's, you know, it's the number talk. They don't, they can't get it, you know, just the core. So we're just not, we're not just stamping, okay, you all get dumped in this and you all have to do this. Right, so this way we're looking at really the specific needs of the student. Um, you know, are they really, is there a, a really significant need for that phonemic awareness initially? And we're kind of figuring out which program is best and most appropriate for their skill gaps and that's the one that, that they would participate in. And that being said, if, we, if they're enrolled in it for a period of time and we're not seeing that level of growth, then we reassess and we, we need to look at different options because we're not just gonna leave them in there forever. So here's a question that someone had asked me, how many different teaching interventions are, are we utilizing? We've streamlined that significantly so that there's not hundreds of thousands of, of interventions there, there were 26. That are out there. So we're down to 26 year. now. No, we're down to three now in grades three through through eight. Okay. <laughs> System 44, read 180, um, which are run by reading specialists and I spy. Spire. Spire. Mm -hmm. Spire. By okay. special educators. And again, that would help still tailor to the needs of the student. Yes. Now there are some additional programs that are out there for some of our other students that, okay. that may That's require a different approach. And on a case by case basis, those would be considered. They're never eliminated. It's just we don't, you know, blanketly implement right. them. Okay. Because what we want to ensure is that whatever it is that we are implementing, that it's done with fidelity. Uh, that is a, a direct, well, that was a response to my concern last year on the numbers of, of mm -hmm. um, interventions. And, and you all were analyzing which were working and which weren't based on the data. So now you're down to three. That's, that's encouraging because there are so many varieties that I observed with my own job. Well, <laughs> we don't like, want to throw them all out. Which one worked and which one didn't. Yeah. We don't want to throw them all out. No, if something no, works they, for a student. They narrow them down to, there were just so many and some worked and some didn't. Some didn't. So and one of the pieces that, that kind of goes along with this, the idea behind the IEP chairs as coaches, they are coming together quarterly to have conversations as a unit. Um, so it allows them to have those opportunities to kind of art, to articulate to the next grade band what students are doing and what, what is working and what is not so that we're not seeing a disconnect because I think some of that was happening when we had 26. They would leave one school, go to another, and that intervention wasn't there so they started a new one. Um, we're not doing that anymore because we see the value in, in noting the progress that they're making and continuing on that forward momentum. Makes sense. So next steps for ELA, um, you'll notice that we test in third through eighth grade, and then they get a break in ninth grade, and then we test again in 10th. Uh, so it has us wondering in, in this, this four percentage point, you know, regression that happened with our, with our 10th graders this, this past year, uh, got us to wondering, and by us, I mean, uh, along with the, the high school chairs in our most recent meeting, you know, what, what are we doing to support English One classrooms? And what are we doing to keep, to keep that momentum going? Um, and so this shift to MCAP gives us an opportunity to kind of recommit ourselves to our ninth graders, to make sure that they're getting what they need, that we're using the data from their, from their eighth grade year um, to make sure that they're meeting them, we're meeting them where they are, we're hitting those areas of need right away. Um, and to that end, uh, November 11th, which is our high school professional development day, uh, my high school chairs who are great are gonna, gonna help out with some um, customized PD or personalized PD where um, 10th through 12th grade teachers will get to choose their session. Um, but I'm gonna spend some time with our English one uh, teachers and, I, and I'm designing some, some professional development using the data fr from, their, from their eighth grade scores and by middle school. Um, and, and we'll work with them to get them the support they need so we can kind of 
recommit ourselves to our ninth graders and what we're doing to support those teachers and to support to support those those students. Um, continued curriculum development in all grades. Um, Slifting, uh, the standards are staying the same, but some of the acronyms have changed for the writing assignments. So we'll be revising the ones that are already written to, to meet the MCAP um, expectations in terms of the acronyms and the wording of the prompts so that our students in, in their tier one courses and their core classes have exposure. And you will have exposure. subtitles for us for all these acronyms because you know we don't get it. <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and with um, to further <laughs> to further support um, the problem of practice. So as our schools work through the data wise process and in their um, in their English language arts or in their English classes as they determine their their problem of practice. You know, making sure the principals and specialists and chairs know that know that we're here as an added support um, and being able to go out there and, and do what they need, whether it's real time coaching or uh, yeah professional development specific to the school. Um, we want to make sure to do that and, and DataWise gives us that opportunity. Great. Any questions? Any questions? For English language arts? Okay. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This slide is very quick. Um, <laughs> like Mrs. Smith mentioned, um, a lot of the data is still under embargo, which is why there are some pieces we weren't able to share with you tonight. And that was actually a little bit unexpected. Um, and so right now the state's projecting possibly uh, the end of this month, maybe even into November, but the assessments listed here, we just, we can't share them publicly because they haven't been released by the state yet. And that included that science. You know, they didn't, um, the MISA, the science data was anticipated to be released in September and it, it got moved. So we don't know why it's mm -mm. computer error out of our hands. Yeah. I understand that. I just didn't know. But that yeah. is no longer a graduation requirement. That's right. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. the HSA is. The HSA yeah. is, yes. Mm -hmm. The HSA is. Um, the MISA, the science assessment, um, they, there was, uh, that was passed at a, over the summer at a State Board of Education meeting that students are going to sit for the assessment um, but don't have to pass it. And there's currently conversation for seniors about English 10 and Algebra 1 right now, but nothing's been approved yet since it's going to be a new assessment. But the government is correct. Yes, all students need to pass it or do the bridge project. And then also uh, the, the MSAA, so the multi-state alternate assessment, overall results have not been released to the public yet. We've had them internally, so we can use them with our staff to make instructional decisions for those students, and we've been able to do that, but we just can't share them publicly. Okay, so you, you do have, so you mm -hmm. do the thought, okay, well that's, yeah. I mean, yeah. because I feel you do all this work and get all this stuff, and then it delays your time to react to it. Yeah. So sure. you do have it, so it's mm -hmm. just not public, okay. Yeah, we've actually had the science data since the summer too. Um, we've had a lot of this data. So the great thing is we are able to use it in our planning. Uh, we just can't share it publicly, so. That's fine, but yeah. I mean, it just scares me when you do all this work and then you can't use it for the right. next school year. Yeah. That, that would be an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the next the couple, MSA, MSAA, would you repeat? Sure. I'm sorry. That's the multi-state alternate assessment. So for students with disabilities and IEPs who qualify for an alternate assessment to be assessed in, with a different assessment. And we get those results back as well. Um, and so the next two charts, first I want to apologize because these are very busy. These are very busy charts. There's a lot of information. Um, because we're looking at a lot of different pieces. So we have three years of comparative growth. And this one first is looking at juniors um, and the college career readiness indicator where they are by the end of that 11th grade year. And so overall, just to kind of sum it up, about 45.6% of last year's juniors um, met those college career readiness standards. However, I. Um, if you go to, I really just want to go to the next slide because you will see those numbers just jump up by the time kids are seniors. So if we go to the next one, you'll see that by the time, um, you know, and, and the college career readiness indicators, those are different from the graduation requirements. So this is, and there's a lot that goes into this. Um, but by the time our seniors graduated last year, 75.5% not only met the graduation requirements, but they met these college career readiness indicators. That includes... Um, certain, uh, you know, getting certain um, scores on assessments, whether it be the SAT, the ACT, AP exams. Um, it also could be uh, 
being duly enrolled in courses. So for an English course or a math course that meets certain requirements, students can meet it that way as well. And then by the time they get to 12th grade, if they're not designated college and career ready yet, then um, there's some other metrics that are considered as well, and that includes the career and technology education program. And so it's really looking at the technical skills assessment. Um, so that's also a factor. Um, recently, it's not highlighted on the slide, but they added in even the military ASVAB scores are now one of the things they look at. Um, so my office, uh, one of the things we do is we gather all of that data and report it to the state. And I'll tell you, it's just so impressive when you look at our seniors by the time they graduate and how much they've accomplished. Um, even with the CTE, with the industry certifications and the technical skills assessments, I mean, we had students who had multiple like it wasn't just one. And we, we called like, well, which one do we report? Because we have students who have a lot. Um, and, and that's really, really exciting because it tells us that when our students are graduating, they really are college and career ready in a lot of different ways. And they're able to show their skills in different ways that aren't just English and math, but really, really expand to um, that well-rounded curriculum. Um, something else I would like to highlight is that if you look at the both column for 2018-19 and you look at our student groups, you will just see across the board that we had significant, significant improvement for our student groups, which again is just so exciting and just tells me that we are doing phenomenal work at our high schools and making sure that all students um, are college and career ready by the time they graduate. I mean, again, just in one year when you compare two groups of students, just really, really um, big growth for, for our students. So that tells me we are doing great things and we need to keep doing them and keep moving in that direction so that every single student when they graduate not only has met those graduation requirements, but that they have those other, um, they've met those other metrics as well, that they're just gonna go do great things in the world, so, and lots of different things. Good question, the dual enrollment, it's like just one class, they just do it once that makes it college and career ready? For this one, um, so dual enrollment, the definition for last year for English was admission to and enrollment in an appropriate ELA college credit bearing course. So for that one, if they passed that course with a acceptable grade and it was one of the courses that did meet the requirement. And it was similar for math, it needed to be a mathematics course. But that's a very small population um, compared to the whole. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, it's, but it is another, mm -hmm. another point piece. for them. Yeah. So there to get this, I've forgotten the, the CCR uh, <laughs> it's, it's to meet lot. that. Is it uh, one for English and one's for math, mm -hmm. and that's it? And then if they meet one of these things for each of those, they they're co college or career ready. Is that right? Yes. So they have to meet um, certain metrics. So we do like we started administering the SAT universally because that's something as well, and it's also just a great opportunity to give every student the opportunity to take SAT um, during the day. But they do need to meet um, one of those things, and there's big lists, and they keep changing. Um, but I think the nice thing, even though it's sometimes it's overwhelming the amount of information, but the positive thing is that I think it allows students to shine in the areas where they have skills and talents, and it doesn't just need to be in certain areas, but it really I think covers a host of areas for our students. So I, I, I appreciate that the state kind of keeps looking at that and thinking about, especially like the addition of, again, the, the ASVAB um, military test is, is a good example of, let's look at different ways that kids are really showing us that they're excelling and are gonna go be um, productive and successful after high school, so. What, what, if just they do don't, what if they don't make any? They don't make um, well, they still can meet graduation requirements, okay. but this is just a separate college and career indicator that the state of Maryland um, really has set kind of as an internal goal that not only will our kids meet graduation requirements, but above and beyond that, we're going to make sure they're really prepared. Mm -hmm. We felt like last year it would take a lot longer than this to go up as far as we yeah. have, because yeah. we were quite low mm -hmm. on the whole yeah. to get to that 75%. Mm-hmm. Or the, uh, the 90, this yeah. year is the 90, the one before that was the 75, but both years I felt it would take us way more mm -hmm. time than this. Yeah, this is a big jump. Yeah. Really, really exciting. So, and just, you know, again, kudos to our high schools and our staff who are just supporting each and every student to get them there because it's really what it takes at the high school level are our caring adults who are really just impacting the lives of each child and making sure that every every um, student has the opportunity to, to show you know, and, and get into these different pathways to make sure that they have that um, option when they graduate. Um, so 
starting to wrap up a little bit. So world languages, um, and I will invite Mr. Bell up here for just a moment. So we do have one goal um, for world languages that talks about by the end of 2021, 60% of seniors will have completed three or more credits in the same world language. And you can see we have lots of trend data here, and I will let Mr. Bell that. All right. Good evening, Captain Kelly, board members, Dr. Kane, executive team. Uh, I just wanted to share with you, uh, world languages, we're actually in a beautiful state of renewal. If ever there was a golden age for world languages, it's actually right now. We're, we're embarking on it. And I say this, and I, I give all the credit in the world to our world language teachers, because this summer we, we just revamped our entire curriculum and we renewed, uh, it was a textbook adoption, which was brand new, levels one all the way through four. And we had 13 out of 15 world language teachers writing this new curriculum. The only reason we didn't have 15 out of 15 because one was out of the country and another one was working on admin leadership uh, classes. But they were also kept in the loop. So that speaks to the direction that we're heading and they wrote it together as a team. Now some some other strategies that we're also after that the, that the data doesn't really paint the picture on is uh, creating some excitement. Uh, we brought the seal up by literacy to Queen Anne's County for the very first time. We had 13 that passed at Kent Island. We had seven at Queen Anne's High School. And so we're on a track. That's the kind of data I'm gonna be looking at uh, year after year. Uh, how can we keep those numbers increasing? Because once that starts, sparking that fire, your students are gonna to wanna to take language classes more than just twice for the, the, you know, passing the state graduation requirements and going beyond. Now, if you wanna dive in deeper on the website, I went out and interviewed uh, at both high schools, students from both those uh, high schools that achieved that seal by literacy, and I put those video clips up on the, the county website, and there are some amazing stories uh, that those students shared at both high schools, and, and I applaud the, the teachers that really champion this. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing, we've invited master guest speakers. We got a, a partnership with a, a renowned speaker who sits on the board of ACTFL, which is the American Council for Teaching Foreign Languages. And she's been working with our crews, uh, delivering professional development, the, the most quality professional development they've ever seen in their lives. They're, they're so excited. Uh, our first professional development was based on uh, creating communication rich language uh, learning environments with core practices that addresses the reluctant language learner and how to engage that student. We've been moving away from uh, attacking grammar from a rote memorization practice and we're attacking it more from a, a perspective of putting in, into context where it actually matters using words in, in an authentic way. So authenticity, that's, that's the word of the year for them. They're, they're, they're bringing authentic teaching and learning practices in classrooms, more dynamic for their students. And I'll say we've had increases also in uh, both uh, French and Spanish honor societies at both ends of the district, which is also gonna continue um, fueling that. So this, uh, this November and again in the spring, uh, we're gonna be attacking uh, authentic resources to teach uh, grammar in concept and context. We're also gonna be attacking embedding authentic resources into lesson plans um, and assessing student performance in authentic ways, speaking and listening in ways that will also naturally lend itself to obtaining the seal, uh, where a student is actually can say, even better than achieving AP credit, they can actually say they are bilingual and employers love, love, love hearing that. It's one thing to pass the AP exam, it's another thing to say you are fluent and bilingual. So we're in a great, we're heading in a great direction and like I said, with the new textbook adoption that just rolled out, we just wrote the curriculum this summer, they're getting comfortable with it this year. It's gonna take a little while to be able to speak to that and we're gonna do nothing but continue to grow, so very excited about the direction for world languages. So you're using an organic pr approach to this. How is that measurable? 
Well, it's measurable um, through our assessments. We're assessing it exactly based on the American Council for Teaching Foreign Languages, and we're using all of that, all of those rubrics and all of those measures, listening, speaking, writing, all of it, it, it it's all measured in. Whereas before, they might take you know, some old exams where they just had multiple choice questions, true, false questions. This is where they actually have to speak the part, record it. I mean, it's, it's authentic learning and it's dynamic. And it's all, each level, we've set it up to where it's all based on advanced placement friendly theme language. So each level scaffolds and it kind of actually spirals. It's not really a linear, linear build. It really spirals from level to level. So the students continue to, to grow and they kind of circle back to review some of the skills, you know, from the beginning level, and then they keep growing. So it's going in, it's, it's a exciting direction. You talk to this foreign language teacher, so they'll tell you. So shout outs to them. Okay. Thank you. C'est magnifique. Thank you. <clears throat> and the seal of biliteracy is one of the college career readiness indicators. So we do see that there as well. So that's very exciting. Um, so just to, we have, just a couple more slides. Um, so this slide captures <clears throat> our students who have completed an AP or honors course. <coughs> and so the goal here was 75%. And we've, we've met that. Um, we really, I mean, met it last year and we are just maintaining there that we, by the time our students graduate, they have taken an AP or an honors course or dual enrollment. So that's really exciting that we've hit that. Um, and, and that might be something that we, we talk about even setting that a little higher because that's really, when really you say wonderful. Completed, that means pass. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Test or whatever. So yep. Top, earn credit. Mm -hmm. Earned a, a yeah. earn credit. Yeah. Yep. So really exciting. Is that part of the um, an AP or honor? I mean, honors, is that included as a CCR? You know, I'm going to say uh, the, it's the AP honor. test. It's actually the test, it's the AP test. So, but honors classes are not part of it. Okay. <coughs> of course not. They're not weighted. Still it's taking. academic. Still it's just academic. I'm not asking for anything. I'm just bringing it up. <laughs> but they still have grades in the okay. class. Mm -hmm. Pass or not. And then this very final um, data slide. So we're looking at seniors who earned at least a, a score of three on the AP exams. So now we're looking at that score. Um, or earned a college credit while in high school. And again, that goal initially when it was set was 40%. And you can see every year, I mean, we are just building, building, building. And so that again is really exciting that um, not only are students taking AP courses, but they're getting that score of three or higher um, or they're earning college credit. So, and that can be uh, just a really great incentive for a student. You begin to earn that college credit um, to really um, incentivize, you know, attending college when you graduate because you've already, you're already part way there. So. Okay, and conclusion, <laughs> I kept this from last year. This is Mr. <laughs> Brown's slide. Um, great things are happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And, and one thing I did really like about, and like I said, I, I really stuck to the format from last year, was that I, I appreciate how it really flows up to our, our students when they graduate. And I think that the story here is that when students are graduating, they, they just are so well-rounded and they have accomplished so much and they are going out and they're contrib contributing to our society and our community in such wonderful ways. Um, and so we, it's just, that is the great, the great things that are happening is that students are coming out of our school system and, and just becoming really productive, wonderful adults. And so um, I know we had lots of time for questions. Um, here's contact information, but of course, I'm always willing to take any more questions if anyone has any, anything outstanding. I know this is a long presentation. <laughs> It was great, great presentation. For all may, of you. may I add Thank one you. thing, Captain Kelly? Uh, I know every year that we do this presentation, and I know it, it can be somewhat lengthy, uh, but this is what we do as a school system. Uh, at the heart, the superintendent always says it, it's about teaching and learning. And uh, I could not be more proud of the team that we've assembled. Uh, in the division of curriculum instruction. And I think you can see tonight, uh, they're truly experts in their field. And I know on behalf of the superintendent, we could not be more proud uh, of the work that they do every do, that they do every day to support the work that teachers do in the classroom. And, and please join me just to give them a round of applause. I'll, I'll pay for that this week. <laughs> 
It's her time. Indeed it is. Thank and thank well you done. Very, well. very well done. Yeah, thank and you. we just are so happy to have you and all of our new brothers and sisters. Somebody <laughs> said uh, no relation, but they really are brothers and sisters in C&I. So thank you. Thank, thank you all you for so what much. you do. And thank you, Mr. P, for your leadership. It's incredible how excited you get about statistics and data. <laughs> yep. it's, you're, you're, you were just breaking the surface here, too. <laughs> Oh my She's God. containing herself. So I am. I don't know how to type it. She's yeah. They've all, got, they've all got that bug, you know. Yeah. Well, especially when you see growth with students, because yeah, that's, that's why we are all here. And, and that's why I love data and statistics and research, because it works. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting to share um, this kind of data and, and really see how it's affecting kids. So, yeah. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We will take a 10 minute break. Everybody back at 8 30. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Next item on our agenda is the CIP, Ms. Polinge. There she is. Good evening, Captain Kelly, members of the board, and Dr. Kane. Mm -hmm. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I'm here this evening to request your approval for the fiscal year 2021 mm -hmm. Capital Improvement Program submission. And this is our annual request for funding from the Maryland Public School Construction Program. On board docs, you received a full packet of information. It's a very large document, and it essentially gives you all of the backup information that the state requires, all of the numbers, all of the dollar figures. There's one crucial piece of information that I'd like to point out, and that is the Form 102.4. It's the summary of current projects that's on page 81. And that is where we outline our priorities for the next fiscal year and the upcoming fiscal years. So that's the one stop place to look at what we're really planning to do over the next few years. Our priorities for fiscal year 2021, number one is Bayside Elementary School, a window and door replacement. The overall total of that project is estimated to be 328,000. Priority number two, Sudlersville Elementary School, the Chilla replacement for $337,000. Sudlersville Elementary School fire alarm replacement is the third priority at $332,000. And the fourth priority is the Ken Island High School roof replacement at approximately 4.5 million and that job will span construction over two consecutive summers since it's a large job we won't be able to complete it in one year and it would probably be a, a long project and something that was fairly disruptive to so they'll try to be done while school's not in session correct and if you'll recall the state contribution that queen anne's county currently has is 51 percent of all eligible construction costs. So we'll be asking for that amount from the state and then the uh, portion that's not covered will be what we'll be requesting from the county in our capital budget when we get later into the season. So I'm happy to answer any questions, go over anything in the CIP in more detail if I can help to explain anything for you. It's I've asked a question. I think you've answered it before on number five and six, the Board of Education and the Center of Middle School. Yes. We're doing that study to find out new re renovation, but That's to me, correct. the Board of Education and that academy also might play a role to role with, with if the school was vacant or something. That's correct. So we'll be looking at that through the studies. And the main reason that that's included here in our CIP plan is that we're giving the state a heads up that these projects are planned to happen. We're in the process of feasibility. If we determine that there is state funding that we're eligible for for those projects, then we'll be looking at planning approval in one of the consecutive years and then eventually funding request for those projects. We just want to keep a placeholder there so that they know that those are potential projects coming down the line for us. And this, this is way down the bottom of the list. Ken Allen and Queen Anne's 22 million projects. What, what are we expanding them or redoing them? Or? It's still undetermined. 
Uh, several years ago, we had a placeholder for a career in technology education center. Uh -huh. And it was determined at that time that the plans really weren't formulated far enough to consider that. The state asked us numerous times how far we had gone in that planning. And so at that point, we removed that particular building from our CIP. But instead, we're looking at, at some point, both of our high schools will need additions not only for capacity, but also for enhanced programs. So we're keeping those on there as placeholders as well. Not sure that our numbers are going to show that necessarily in fiscal year 2025 or 2026, but we wanna keep those on the radar of the state so that they know that those projects at some point will be coming to fruition for us. Back in the 90s, we had a, a, a board and we made recommendations of school sizes. And I think our high schools were capped at 12 or 1300. Yes. We still That's correct. keep that policy in effect. So when we say it, we're not looking at making a, a 2,000, 2,500 school right now. No. no, I don't think that we would be looking at that. It's more how can we accommodate some additional CTE space, uh, what the square footage needs would be for that and what we'd be eligible for. Okay. Part of that um, CTE concept I've been involved in that you know years on talking about it was a, fe a basically a feasibility study are we going to have a CTE in between the two schools are we going to make sure we have CTE equal projects at both schools like cosmetology at both schools because there's a lot of uh, things going on with that and that was going to be a potential solution so it was a big study of all of it bring the ninth grade back to Kent Island there are still portables that are permanently in now at both high schools. So I mean, this this is completely changed, and it's it's way back in 2025. So that pretty yeah. much died. I mean, it was going to be a good analysis of you know Ellendale was coming into Ken Island. You know they've got you know all these increases, and but it looks like that completely died. And we, we there are a lot of things that could be solved with a comprehensive look at the whole situation. And I, yes. There was a discussion on a magnet school, I think, in the Queenstown Graysonville area that would feed the whole county, but it would be a magnet school for certain programs, mm -hmm. both educational and mm -hmm. trade. That's been looked at for years. And that's been looked at for years. Um, yeah. We gave the land up. Huh? I think we gave the, the land The county up. gave land up. The, bo the board at the time voted it down. They wanted it in Centerville. They didn't want it in Queens. Well, I know, but we're, we're talking Lansing 20 years. We won't know. be here. Well, but I'm just saying that's one of the ones that was floated out there one time when Magnet School, I guess Dr. K might know where that, about No, I don't. That not not this one county, but Magnet Schools in general. Oh, oh yeah. You know, where they have Magnet Schools in bigger municipalities yeah. where, you know, it's, it's okay. a you know, more school that, you know, you know in, in our county being central located. You know, it's missing on here. We had a slate for a Roman Coke school on, uh, when I got here in 2012, mm -hmm. yes. well, I believe they still uh, have that land right. for that. The Roman Coke yeah, Elementary Roman School was on here, right. had been on here for like five or six very years before I got time. here. Yes, and for a uh, very long time, and we haven't been able to justify the enrollment right. numbers yet. Right. And it may never because they put the, put the septic sewer down project in and mm -hmm. realigned those lots and only so yeah. many. I think so it's there, only 500. There may be no justification. Only 1,500 they could uh, build. But the other way around, we may increase the numbers. We when may they have to move the ninth grade back to the high school. Yeah, they may. To, and that's you know. something we continually look at every year when we're looking at our numbers. We speak with the county, and right now they don't anticipate in the next few years that there will be enough building permits that will be issued on Ken Island due to the sewer upgrades that it would affect our enrollment numbers at all. That could change very quickly. Right. Right. Yeah, because it's a 10-year project, and I mean, right. we're only in year two. So are we... And we aren't even hooked up. Some I, people are, but are not we, everyone. I have what, a qu another question. Okay. Um, the supplemental info sheet... Yes. You have down there the, the number of, there's a number of schools without secured entry, and there's a few, like two of them, that will not be fixed within the next three years. So, so the supplemental information sheet is something else that the state also asks us to compile, and essentially they're asking us questions about our portable classrooms, our open classroom space, and now they've added uh, interest in security. So we recently conducted a study of our five buildings that do not have secure entry vestibules. That's where you enter a vestibule and then you're locked into that until you're allowed to entrance into the office. Five of the schools are currently set up that way. Two of them have fairly easy fixes 
And so Mr. Pender has requested security funds from the state this year to complete those two projects. The other three are a little bit more difficult because it changes the way they actually operate their front office. So we're still looking at those, but knowing that coming down the pike, we want to make those security upgrades too, but it probably won't happen within the next year. So three years, it indicates on here, right? Yeah. Okay, and that was my concern. It was, you know, it, well, Centerville Middle School could change based upon right, that's, where we go with that building. Mm -hmm. um, we, as Ms. Poland said, we were uh, just approved the state for a grant to um, do Queen Anne's County High School and Kennard Elementary School. Um, Ken Island High School is gonna be tough and Bayside is gonna be tough. It's gonna take, if we wanna do this, really configuring the office, moving it over to like say the media center and, and vice versa, restructuring a lot of it. Um, you know, again, back you know, 20 years ago, nobody was planning for these right, types of right. things. Possibly grading Mad uh, Bayside Elementary School. So then now that water comes back on it. Who's the third, the third one? Um, Ken Island, Bayside. And ba Bayside Elementary School, Kennard, I'm sorry, Bayside Elementary School, Ken Island High School, and um, Centerville Middle School. Centerville Middle, oh yeah. Right. 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 And we don't, and that might three be that new. The tough, yeah. Okay. Uh, all our schools have advanced safety systems. Yes, sir. Yes. What you keep an eye on and yep. that we don't always. They all have access control, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the tough part about the three that I just mentioned you're relying upon the secretary or the SRO to make sure that person to enter that building is coming into, you know, the right location. Your office. Yep. That's correct. Got that gap between the mm -hmm. office. And, okay. So do we need a motion to accept the F21 capital improvement plan? Is that what I... We, we need to make it a... Yes. Do you, and that includes the supplemental or would, will that be part of the plan? That is part of the packet, yes. Okay. So I need a motion to approve the... Queen Anne's County Public School CIP for, um, for this year, for 2019. Fiscal year 2021. 2021. 2021. So moved. Second. Do I have a second? second. Okay. Motion to second approve the CIP for FY 2021. Uh, all in favor, Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Well, Mr. Pages, fine when I call your name. Kathy Kelly? Yes. Mr. Harper? Yes. Ms. Lissette? Yes. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pullen. That's a big job. Okay, human resources. Uh, I need a motion to approve the human resources and substitute bus driver report that was presented in closed session. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the human resources and substitute by Drive, bus driver report, Mrs. Wright. Well, members, again, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative motion carries. Okay, next item is the purchase of the special needs bus. Yes, ma'am. I'm seeking approval to purchase a 2020 Thompson Safety Liner C224 passenger special needs bus. Um, this bus will replace 3905, which is no longer in service. Um, we have uh, picked up a few extra special needs students, and we are looking to purchase this through the uh, intergovernment, intergovernmental cooperative purchasing agreement <coughs> from Montgomery County Public Schools, which allows us to piggyback on them for $107,976. Okay, do we have any discussion on that? Yeah. Um, I've made a phone call to somebody that owns an ambulance company in the state of Maryland, mm -hmm. and they run vans that will accommodate two wheelchairs and driver, passenger, and that. And the cost is somewhere between thirty-two and thirty-eight thousand dollars per van. All right, I understand what you're saying, but the ambulance would have to be approved by MSDE. I, all, all I, I mean, I didn't go into I, deep enough to yeah. know what the school criteria is their specs yeah M MSD. And they, they were vans that are purchased and then retrofitted in a company in baltimore uh to do this i mean they they're running from a hospital to hospital and taking patients so i don't know yeah. if the, what this if it qualifies or not but um 
I mean, the price is a is significant difference. Sure. And I don't know if it's something yeah. that suits. It's just something to look into. The, two th the first thing I thought it was cheaper to operate, which it probably is. Mm -hmm. The two things that he brought up to me was you need a Class D license to drive these things. So you'd have more ability to have drivers, I would think, that don't have the bus license. And that he says when he goes to hospitals and medical centers, it's easier to get around. I said, well, that might not be a big issue to us because schools usually have a big enough area to get buses around. It's just an FYI. Yeah, we'll take a look at I, it. I brought it up at when we, this thing, and I got a little information on it. Mm -hmm. Certainly can put you on to somebody or sure. uh, look at it um, if, if it's feasible. He did mention it. When you get up to close to 38 to 40, that's a bigger van that will handle two wider wheelchairs. Yes. They're different sizes, he says, for wheelchairs when you get these vans. So here's, why do we need a 24 passenger bus? Well, we never know what's gonna happen in the future. And say you're going to take a student on a field trip somewhere, you can put a wheelchair on there and then also have students on the bus with them. You can have multiple so wheelchairs. So it could be a backup bus as well, yeah. you, rather than relying on, I'm only, I'm only just yeah. justifying if we need 24 people and we only have one that only carries two wheelchairs and an attendant and a, and a driver at a cheaper rate i i'm, I'm just, just trying to justify no, you it. can you know we don't know five years from now the bus is going to be here 15 years i mean we don't know five years from now what's going to be occurring with the you know special needs population or you know like i said the configuration of it you can always change on there and it might not be, you know, we might need this bus currently. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, we and do. You have, you have options there. This is limited to probably two wheelchairs and whatever. So, you know, you're limited more. But what, in our fleet, would one of those suffice at some time to have one of them, two of them, rather than two more? I mean, I just something okay, to look at. We just have, to, we have to work with the Department of Transportation and mm -hmm. the And I don't, yeah, yeah, I, you know. That's no problem. There's just something to throw out there. It's, uh, no, it's, if we have... You know, if, if we had more income, right. it'd be great to have it as well. Yep. That way, if we're transporting two students in wheelchairs over across, the, you know, Kennedy Krieger and mm -hmm. the other places that are closer to them, that would be able to accommodate with a smaller bus. You know, and what we're seeing also is with after school activities, I mean, students, you know, with special needs are staying after for, you know, sporting events, yes. you know, PFY, those types of things. And, you know, sometimes we get a call at the last moment, hey, such and such as after school for this program. And, you know, we have to have a special needs bus being able to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and all of our special needs buses, um, you know, are air conditioned because obviously looking at the Bay Bridge traffic right now, you know, sitting there for an hour and a half to two hours at sometimes, you know, is pretty tough uh, on a bus that does not have air conditioning, so. Have we considered about buying a bus that has a bathroom on it? We haven't at this time. I've, is there I've one never available? seen one. But okay, that's what that was <coughs> What question. we've been trying to do is make special stops along the way if we're you know, occurring in traffic and those kinds of things. Okay, so, well, I, I'm, we're digressing. Sorry. I just want to, nope. it was a thought. No, I was thinking of that too at one point. I mean, it's very difficult for these students with this traffic. But, but I think there's a state law that they can only be on the bus for a certain amount of time before you have to stop and give them a break. And, it's, and a handicap, it might be tough as the bus is moving. You know, just have some, you know. Oh, yeah. Stop. Uh, this idea is just brought up that if we have one or two students for a year going somewhere, would it fit, fill a void at some point? And it might or might not, you know. Yeah. And certainly, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and usually the problems are in the details. But we have to something. We'll to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. So I need a motion. Um, is there any other comments on that? Motion to approve the purchase of a 2020 Thomas Seth T. Liner C224 passenger special needs bus with a wheelchair lift to replace bus 3905. Uh, it will be in the amount of $107,976 coming out of the FY 2020 capital budget. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. <coughs> to buy the 24 passenger special needs bus. All in favor, Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morset? Yes. Ms. Perlo? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pender. Next item is policies for first read. 
Thank you, Captain Kelly. Um, board members, Dr. King, before you is uh, for first read a brand new policy, policy 310 and regulation 310.1 uh, to kind of streamline our procurement um, policies um, for goods and services. Um, we really now do not have a formal policy or regulation on the procurements of goods and services. We followed an internal set of rules that kind of mimic best practices. Um, but this is a new policy and regulation. It follows prescribed sound purchasing procedures from other Maryland boards of ed, as well as Maryland state government. The policy formalizes solicitation thresholds when bids and other purchasing documentation must be obtained and other guidelines Queen Anne's County Public Schools will use throughout the procurement process. Um, with that introduction, um, be happy to answer any questions. Wonder, um, you all have some questions. One of the questions I would have, what are we now? I, I see in here 15 and 15. So, so, so currently, if it's under $5,000, you pretty much have carte blanche to go do what, what you want. Um, we, we always obtain, try to obtain the lowest you know, price from mm -hmm. multiple vendors. If it's between five and $10,000, we're asking for three <coughs> verbal quotes, and that's simply making a phone call, writing down on a piece of paper that I called Bill, Jim, and George, and these were the prices for that product or service. If it's over uh, 10, but less than 25, then we ask for three written quotes. Right. And then once you get over 25, then it becomes a formal bid or um, piggybacking on a, another county's contract or through a um, purchasing cooperative. So you, you want to say we want to up this, what you're asking? For. Yes. Is, I would think that one we have now is good, but. The, the, State of Maryland allowed, um, had, had raised their, they call it actually under $50,000, they actually call it small procurements. And they passed that law, I think, back in 2017. And the boards can sort of ride along that, um, that same threshold. And when we did an analysis amongst all our CFOs, seven counties are already at that, this was last year, we're already at that $50,000 threshold. It does make the procurement process a little bit smoother. We can certainly bring them back for information to the board of what we did approve. So it isn't, you know, that we, we wouldn't make you informed of anything. Um, but with prices going up and things like that, and as you know, we, we had a lot of um, contracts last uh, board meeting that were sort of things that we had to do, such as the non-public um, um, placements and all of the um, contracted PT and OT. And some of that would have um, been able to, you know, process a little bit faster uh, with under this new policy. Uh, I called the, I talked to two county commissioners and the five to 10, three verbal, the 10 to 25, three written quotes, the 25 cap um, is what they do. And um, they would really appreciate the fact that we stayed in line with the county. They asked us that? I asked them. So, because I, I, I being on the policy committee, uh, we sat and we hashed this out and um, so under policy elements number four, C, the solicitation threshold that prompts a formal procurement shall equal the greater of 50,000. I think it should go back to 25,000. That's what we're used to doing. This, this policy is what we're trying to make it more formal than what we've had. Yeah, we currently do not have a policy. I would suggest, I, I, I like the idea of having a formal policy, but I, I, don't have, I would rather stay closer we are. And if we find out in the next year, it tends to be a major issue, we could come back and address it at that point. So going back to 25. 10 and 25. And if we find out that it, since it's, it would be a big issue over the next year, uh, I mean, well, and I don't if, like being here any longer than anybody else does. Well, but, as Mr. but as far as people that are board members, I think it's some of our duty, and I trust everybody here, but let us take the heat once we vote on it and show what's going on. And then it takes, you know, we know about it. We well, offer it. As Mr. Fister pointed out, we just went through a whole a whole slew of contracts that we had to go over and we should review those contracts because we are responsible for that that is my frame of mind on it i like the idea of um you know, seeing how it goes i mean this is a lot of work this is awesome this um policy this is hard to make up and, and get it right but i'd like to just keep it where it is right now and be be sure that personally be, to be sure that it's it's right for us okay. and you can come back i know you're supposed to review this in 2024 but you can clearly come back 
um, and plead your case in a year when we have a better idea, when we're keeping better track of it and, and know what the impact is of, on the staff. That would be my input. Well, there's also one here under, uh, uh, let me just finish, under policy elements. Um, exemptions from the competitive procurement process without limitation the following instructional contracted services where the fiscal year cumulative is less than 75,000. Um, why isn't it competitive process? That's P3. So, so what this was intended to address is exactly what we went through when we, I will use the term have to provide services. And this was mainly focused around what we just went through with all of the contracted OT, PT, speech therapy services. Some of those services, as you were well aware, were already implemented by the time because of the needs of the child, because we didn't have the staff you know, to, to do those services. That's what this was intended to specifically address, was those type of things that we could then just continue on with doing our, our due diligence and making sure our students are, provided, are provided the services that they require don't when you, we don't have employees to do so. Don't you want a competitive procurement process for that to make sure that they we're getting, I, I don't want to say the bang for our buck, but making sure we have the best contracted services just to give these we do do that and with some of these services we may even actually go out to multiple companies because some of these companies don't have the staff themselves to do this so we may have three companies that we will access their services from and say okay I need some occupational therapy services sorry all my therapists are booked now we have to go to company number two and and that would just slow down you know going through that competitive bid process for each and every one of those our students wouldn't get the services that they need but when you come to the board like we did last meeting, we just, we are, I mean, I think we okayed everything. Yes, absolutely. We ask questions, mm -hmm. uh, and you look at values that when you're not paying benefits and other uh, additional costs, it's not any probably different. And the question I have for you anyway, later on, is what we're taking out of salaries for contracts, are we, you know, close? And then, you know, because that's always something to keep an eye on that we're not over. But, you know, if a, if a person's making, 80 and you contracted for 90 we're saving money because the benefits would outweigh mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. extra ten thousand yeah. dollars yeah. yeah. so i think we see that but it's, i think as, as a board i like to ask that question okay. that what's I, going on. I like to be seen i mean i i know that a lot of those instructional contract contracted services that we just passed were 75 and more yes they were um and if we find out we have a problem where somebody you got to make a decision like that and there's not you know then we, we can address it if, if we find it all be contacted if that hurts you know your hiring practice i just want to be sure and that you are understanding what he is saying about the no bid part so for the example that we had last time when we had psychologists that we right. had to right. get from multiple so instead of saying okay we went to company a and they didn't have any, we don't want to have to go bid that right. again because then that's wasting time. Mm -hmm. We aren't serving kids. We want to be able to have an A, a B, a C, however it goes, Same. so that we can, if we can't get from A, we want to go to B, and that will save us some time. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to let P3 alone because, again, all those services were more than $75,000, especially with the OT, the speech therapy, the, psycho the psychological services. They were all amounted to more that too you would have to bring that to us anyway mm -hmm. with competitive bids mm -hmm. so you know um i'm fine with that i'm not sure you're saying competitive right. bid to me we all know what our salary range is for what we just talked about if it's right. say i'm just gonna pick a number seventy five thousand. Mm -hmm. well if we've contracted somebody for 85 to 90 mm -hmm. it's it's a wash because of benefits and mm -hmm. everything we're going to pay that person 90 a year with benefits mm -hmm. so you know, we can very easily look at that thing and say, yeah, if we'd hired a lady or a gentleman, it would have been 75, but in real dollars, it's 90. Mm -hmm. And we contract this person for 85, 90, or 92. So, you know, it's what we have to have to fill a need. I have no problem. I just like to know what's, right. you know, to see it. Mm -hmm. So the policy elements 4C, going back to 25,000 as a threshold. Yeah, but I, I, I don't want them to be hung up. What are you talking no, for in, P in, in, in or for? August four. Because we no, authorized these things in September. P. A lot I'm of these people were hired in July because you had them on board. I have no problem with that. Now I would have a problem if we hired somebody at 150 well, and we're supposed to be paying but, them seventy five, but well, I think we're all doing But they would have to come to us I'm anyway. Just saying. And that would be and we had none of that anyway. 
Okay, so that's so four C. We're at four C now. We're back to four C. What, what, what about P? Let's finish P. We went He's, to P three. Yeah, I'm fine. You're I'm, fine. I'm leaving it alone. I'm leaving alone. How about Mr. Smith? That was the one, the seventy-five thousand dollar one. It's where they didn't have to have the procurement process for the contract. No, no, right? I have no problem with the procurement okay. process. But we will, we'll see the contract and vote on it. Yes. Right. Yes. We do. We vote on that one then, because yes. you're exempting it right here. You're just exempting no, it from exempting the, it from the from bid, pro from the they bid process. Have, they don't have to bid it. They can hire it and put it out and do it. All right. So we'll leave that on there. But we would like to. We're sending this out for first read, so I don't mind if we. But this is one item they, that the majority of three of you guys up for changing that C four, um, and moving that back to twenty five thousand. Four C. I'm sorry. Four C. Policy. If any element. of these changes in the view of Dr. King or any of the principals here have, you know, a reason for it that we don't see, mm -hmm. tell us. Okay. Because, I mean, we, you know, this, we're reading it now, mm -hmm. bringing up some ideas, sure. get back to us and say, this is why it does work or doesn't work, and then we can... Yep, we've got keep, some time. So. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So does anyone have any more changes they would like to make right now before we send it on? Well, in the First regulation, then, under... Regulation this, we're not at regulation right now. We're oh, at policy. I apologize. Right. Go ahead. Policy? Okay, so I need a motion to move this out for a first read with so the change for policy 4C in, incorporated in it before it goes out. Yes, ma'am. I moved. Okay, and I need a second. Okay, a motion and a second to put this policy out for a first read. Policy for procurement of goods and services. All in favor of Mrs. Wright, please. So this is for the policy and the regulation, which goes Just the policy. Just the policy. Are you voting on separate? We'll plot this separate. Then. Oh, Policy okay. 310. Yeah. Policy with changes. Policy number 310. Yeah, with the change of making the policy element a 4C to go back to 25,000. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Whoever receives finally your name is called Captain Kelly. Yes. Ms. Lupper. Yes. Ms. Lissette. Yes. Ms. Harlow. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, now for Regulation 310.1. We don't vote on the regulation, right. but we do need to match it. Right, we need to and so to match the we, we back up the reg from the policy. So, so whatever changes change happen in the policy, change. we make those changes in the reg. Well, then under approval criteria, the goods and services under goods and, for approval criteria number C, costing more than 25000 that would come before the board for approval, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that just needs to be incorporated in there. So she will make the regulation mm -hmm. match. It'll, it'll, it'll match. match. It'll Actually, match. C and D would, uh, D goes away, correct, Mr. Fister? Yes, D would go away. Okay. Um, or D would be replaced with $25,000, and then I would adjust the thresholds accordingly backwards. And the formal procurement process and the approval of the board. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I have a question on uh, page three of the regulation. Can I just add something to the policy? Um, we worked really hard on this one. Tammy and I were in the meeting. The executive team did an excellent job of bringing this to our table. Um, it was one of the better presented policies from scratch that I have had the pleasure of seeing. Thank you. And I've seen a lot. And we have a very dedicated team in this policy committee, and this was a ton of work, and we we nailed it. Yeah. I walked out of there feeling like we had done more work in two hours than we've done in a long, long time. I was very happy with the progress. Thank you for that. We've been advised by a couple of things that this needs to be tightened up, and I think it's a good document. It's just, you know, tweak it, and then, like you said, we've got a second reading coming up. I don't have problem up. with tweaking it. I just wanted to let everybody know how much work this was. If you I don't mind me. It. And Mr. Fister, you did an excellent job. Thank you. And most of our That's periods and commas were in the right place as need be. So yes. That was good. And well, it's been a little bit of time editing, little bit. but there <laughs> wasn't that much. Yes, it was good. Yes, and the other item I, I wanted to mention yes, is I, I know this, you've passed this through um, our lawyer, and uh, he indicates it's um, well done. And there were some tweaks he was going to yeah, provide gonna, to you. Yes, yes, so ma'am. Thank you for doing that because mm -hmm. he, he needs to look at these policies so we get them right on the legal front. Just one more yes. correction. Uh, under number eight, signing of contracts. Policy. Regulation. 
That's what we're on the regulation. Contracts for matter at or above the solicitation <coughs> threshold, and that should be twenty-five thousand. That would be twenty-five. Thank okay. you, Mr. Fister. And I have another question on the regulation um, under the section seven evaluation of request for proposal. Mm -hmm. um, actually, not a question, but a recommendation. We have these um, these items that we look at for um, competency. Let me see plans for utilization of minority business enterprises. I was wondering if we could add like a G in there to say in support of our local businesses, you know, have we taken a look at it, if anything is available locally as, as one of the items to consider, we, not as a... We can certainly do that. We, we make reference to that. If you look at 5B, a minority business participation in goals, which includes small and yes. locally owned businesses, will be established. So we sort of reference it, but I can certainly tweak that language to make it a little more emphatic, if you'd like. That it does say great. locally owned. It does say locally. Yeah. yeah. Under five. Five. Yeah, under under five, five B, B. When we were referencing mm -hmm. right there. minority business oh, enterprises. Oh, definition of minority. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I can tweak that language and. I didn't jump out at me as local business. That's and fine. I want to support our local businesses. They've been great to us. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. We'll do. Any other uh, changes uh, or ideas? Just so I don't forget to thank Ms. Jones for her attention to this council as well. Abby. She was Abby. also in the committee Abby. meeting. What's that? Yes. Captain Kelly, may I? Um, sure. For the record, Darren Burns, board council. Um, I just want to point out you were talking about the, the signature authority and one of the areas that. Uh, Board Council always caution uh, school systems about and that the auditors look for is to make sure there's that clear designation of authority. And so whether we're talking about this particular regulation and policy or perhaps one where the superintendent's deciding an appeal, long story short is when, when the superintendent has a designee to do a particular task, there should always be that clear line of authority in that person to, to act on, on, in this instance, Dr. Kane's behalf. It's a little more technical with the financial and procurement issues, and I just want to make sure that it is eventually addressed before this is all said and done. Where it says right now in the regulation, superintendent or, or in a policy, superintendent or superintendent's designee, at some place you would want it to say something along the lines of designee being defined as either uh, in policy or regulation, so therefore it's in writing who the designee is. In this case, I believe it's going to be uh, Mr. Fister as the way it's set up, his office, or express written authorization. And you do that because there's a state law that says no contract is valid that's entered into by the board without the superintendent's approval. So by her either signing it or her official designee signing it, that's what makes it a valid and binding contract. So as long as that, that technical piece is addressed, and it could be simply by defining designee, um, that would satisfy that concern. And I just want to make sure it was on the record that none of us forgot that moving forward with the second and third reading. And would you put that in the policy or the procurement, uh, the procedural or the regulation, you mean? Yeah, no, no, you, you, you would address this when it comes to financial oh, procurement issues. You would address this as a, it would be perfectly fine to say in the policy that it has to be provided for in the regulation or express written authorization from the superintendent. And then you, you would just address it there. So could it technically go into the definitions then? Of yeah. what you, could define, you could define it, in, could you could define it in the regulation, and then the policy would simply cross-reference it. But it's important that there be that connection between the authority the superintendent has by statute and the idea of having someone other than the superintendent have to sign every document. So under it's regulation, it. definitions, there you could, could do it that way. F, and that's designated. one of the things I will pass along OCT to Mr. Fister and the team. Okay. Um, I have a question though, is it, could we, do we designate, not necessarily an individual, no, but the position? It's a position. Okay. And, that, and again, that's, that's the, super, the superintendent is the one vested with that statutory authority to approve the contracts you enter into, and that's a check and balance that's by design. Ultimately, it's the superintendent's determination to determine who, the, who, if anyone, I mean, there are probably some systems out there where no one's designated, and the superintendent signs every contract. I think you all have enough sophisticated purchasing going on that it may not be feasible to do that. And if superintendent has a position she wants to fill that role, that's within her authority to choose. So we do. Right. And Mr. Fister is for financial matters. Mr. Peluski is for other matters. There you go. Okay. That's fine. Yep. But it should be in the definitions on the we policy. Right. For, yeah. for this particular one, I think it's for your protection that you would okay. have superintendent define who her authority, her authorized Just say designate. Designate. This yep. would be the assistant. 
CFO. That's correct. So, Mr. Okay. Pister, under definitions, you'll just put designate. We'll add an F. Okay. Yeah. Got and it. I, and, I, and I'll work with you in the language. Yes, it, we'll, absolutely. We'll, we'll repeat what's used in other places as best practice. Okay. There's thank two you. sections. There's definitions in both pieces, so you can put it both. Okay. So I need a motion thank to. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. We don't need, have to vote on regulation. Need a motion to. We, we don't approve. have to vote on the regulation. No, to move it to. First read. Are we oh, doing this first? Read. Read. No, we only did the policy, dear. We only did the policy. We don't I know. We're going to move the regulation to first read with the changes that were recommended. What what Mrs. Harlow was referring to that we don't have to send regulations out to first read only the policy. Oh, I didn't. The regulations are listed. Not what I was saying. Not the reg. Oh, not the reg. That's me. And I think I think you did the policy. Yes. Yeah, we that did. That's first. Oh. So you're good. Okay. Okay. I thought we had to send both out. We've always okay. sent both. We out. just do. We just do. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're done with that one. Thank you. Next one is the um, new courses. Mr. Bell. Your other hat you're wearing. Yes. Okay, so uh, while revising the visual arts high school curriculum uh, this past summer, it came to our attention that there with meeting with school counselors and also with the, the high school art teachers, there may be some situations that arise where a student in a, a level studio two class, it takes the class in the fall and then maybe they wanna take portfolio class the following year instead of in the spring. So we're going to add an, I'm proposing to add an additional level, which would be a level three into the mix. Uh, just to provide some more pathways for uh, students in both 2D studio art and 3D studio art. So it's really just having an additional course offering. Initially, we didn't think we needed it, and that was the feedback from the, the art teachers when we created the initial design. But now the feedback is, let's have a level three. Uh, so that's, that's one proposal. Now, the other one, uh, currently at the high school level, we have a feeder. We have a feeder for our chorus programs. We have a feeder for our band programs. We have a feeder for our visual arts programs. What we're lacking, though, is a feeder for our media arts programs, our feeder for our theater program, and a feeder for our dance programs. Now, the, the Comar regulations, I sat down with Alicia Lee, who's our state fine arts coordinator, and this summer we developed a five-year plan. How can we address this? And I polled our, our teachers when we came back in August, asked them what they wanted. We sat down and had a, a, a long conversation during that professional development where again and again, theater and dance and something more dynamic came up. So what I'm proposing here, and this is based on the feedback from the teachers and what they were all kind of rallying around. And also, I've been out to the performances, and, and we have some amazing theatrical performances that have been taking place at the middle school level. Well, why don't we have a course for it? And right now, we have, we have very small numbers happening in our chorus classes at the middle school level and at the high school level. So why not create something where you can dance, you can sing, you can work on tech crews and do lighting and all kinds of design work. Uh, why can't you have something really dynamic at the middle school level that, that not only satisfies our state Comar regulations, but also simply feeds those high school programs? So this was a, a goal of mine coming in. Look for what's new, look for what's better, and look for what's dynamic for our students. And this was taking our lens from this past year, looking at the visual arts at the high school level, and now turning the lens over to the performing arts and also the middle school level. So this is why the proposal, and uh, we're, I also partnered with uh, some dynamic people who've already scaffolded and created this type of curriculum before, and we're gonna be getting together in November to take a look at how we would do this with our middle school chorus teachers. So that's, that's the plan. <laughs> So we wouldn't add additional staff, we would utilize what we have? We would utilize what we have, and, and it would be that chorus teacher, because, I mean, our band programs are strong, 
and our band programs, they feed each other and they collaborate all the time. But it doesn't always happen with, you know, the chorus teacher. They're the ones that are left teaching a general music class that, brutally honest, the curriculum has been outdated for a long time in that general music area. So why can't we do it all in a music and theater arts class? And they can do dance. Absolutely. For, yeah. Are they certificated to do theater as well? I mean, correct. And we'd be, looking, we'd be looking at theater standards, which also address, and we'd be able to hit certain units, would hit certain dance uh, standards, and certain units would hit certain media arts standards. It's exciting. It's something new. It's something dynamic. And it's something that our teachers are willing to try out. And, and if, it, if it fails, then we'll reassess. But I don't believe it will. Uh, I believe they're excited about it. And I believe that we'll be able to figure out how to make it all work. And also in collaboration with some great partners in PFY who do things after school, too. So this is a discussion that we've also had with Kim Umberger. So everybody's yeah. on board. and. We just got to figure out a way to make it all work and, Dr. Mr. and collaborate. Mr. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, is, sure. is this replay? It, it, it could be an alternative to the requirement for like a general music. It could be, okay. absolutely. And, and this is where in the Comar regulations it says now the new language is that a student can specialize in something in middle school where they could take a theater and music. Art, arts class in sixth grade, and then in seventh grade, and then in eighth grade. And they could be part of a performance, or they could also choose to be behind the scenes. But they could be part of a performance in each of those grade levels. Because, I mean, let, let's face it, I mean, you have many different musical instruments that students can play in band. But chorus, if you can't sing, or you don't feel like you can sing, sometimes those students aren't taking that course. But they might buy into it, and they might be able to be taught it, under the guise of this, where you have multiple things going on in the room at the same time, which is really exciting and fun for kids. Fun. So and we, and that's we have the staff at both high schools to accomplish this. This will be at, this will be at the middle school level. So this would be uh, a first. And our middle schools have staff to accomplish all this. Yeah, they. Yeah, it would be the chorus teacher. It would be the chorus teacher. Absolutely, because right now our chorus classes back up against general music. So. We have an opportunity there where it's not going to replace a chorus class, but it could replace a general music class. It could, it, it, exactly. Big excitement. Big time. And, and feed the high school. And I'm sure as a student board member involved in dance, mm -hmm. you'd be happy to have somebody feeding that program instead of it just starting at the high school level. So. And these two high school classes are going to are they going to require new teachers or just other? Uh, oh, for the studio art classes, no. It it it's just a matter of opening up a new opening up a new section that students could sign up for. They could still very easily the way that we have the curriculum set up, they could very easily still move from a, a studio two course right into the the portfolio course. But this would be for the student that say you know they they do have room in their schedule and they want to take more art classes. So. Why not give them another opportunity? I could see Michelle Moyer being very excited. Honors. These are honors. Well, and, and she was involved in that conversation, too. Uh, and it actually began with she had multiple students that were taking ceramics at, at multiple different, different times and places. And some of these students were taking a lot of independent study classes. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I, I want them to have a structure and a, and a scope and a sequence and something that they're building upon. And this would allow that to happen. And they're really loving the new curriculum right now. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. And so this would just give them an, another opportunity. Nice. So that's. With that aspect of building, there's no prerequisite for the general. For, for which course are you talking? The, the Studio 3 course? The Studio 3. Through eight, oh, the 6 through 8. OK. No, no, no. Yeah, no prerequisite. The building on fundamentals. You, yeah. In middle, at the middle school level, so here's the interesting thing, and, and this is just the way that scheduling works. And at the high school level, you can scaffold the curriculum very easily. But at the middle school level, depending on the school, depending on how things are scheduled, a student may rotate through some different courses, and it's very difficult for them. You may have that kid that and that's the goal, that they could scaffold and, and the teacher could differentiate to build those units. But 
I look at each level in each class as someone who's putting on a performance and they're building towards that performance. So it will capture, it'll be okay for the student that maybe they just come into it in seventh grade uh, for the first time. That's okay, you know? Yep. It, it's very similar to like the way the visual arts are set up where they have a an, sixth grade art, seventh grade art, and eighth grade art. Right. You know, middle school is a lot of trying out to see where you want to focus. Yeah. Oh, definitely. High so you kind of have a little of everything. That's why we always had the middle school plays. Yeah. With the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders all worked together and, and collaborated. We had some wonderful productions over the years at, at both middle schools on the island that, that I got to see and help out with. So I, I'm excited about this. This is this is great. Awesome. And <laughs> and that's why, you know, we were also thinking I mean, this this is very this is modeled off of uh, we were looking at some really dynamic programs um, across the country. In Florida, they have a great model, and it was it's kind of a musical theater model, but we didn't want to call it that because we wanted to attract everybody to it. So uh, a music and theater arts, well, you get some actors in there. You get, you know, a, a, a big melting pot of student interest in that. Well, realm. not everybody wants to do Carousel, but they might want to do Taming of the Shrew. Hey, you've got it. Or, exactly. Or they might want to do the lights. Yeah. They may, and, and technical theater is huge. We've well, had several of our students from Ken Allen High School that started technical, the just the technical side of it, have gone on and gotten careers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you a handful of students right now that graduated with my oldest daughter, Molly, in subsequent years, and um, they've made a career out of it, mm -hmm. so it's awesome That's to see it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to be going out and seeing some new plays happening at the middle schools. Do our uh, student board members have any ideas? Michelle has a question. He's with I know I would have loved to take the musical and theater arts course when I was in middle school since the plays died off my seventh grade year. Mm -hmm. So I think it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of there even being plays when I was in middle school. I know course was really small, even band or something like that was small, but there really wasn't an option for people who like to act in middle school, so I know this will be great for feeding into high schools and then just having it in schools, period. So with your middle schools, are they all equipped with lighting equipment now? I know Sudlersville is. Well, right now, they can all put on a performance. As far as getting high tech with it, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But yeah, right now, I mean, we're, we are equipped to put on performances at each of the middle schools, definitely, yeah. Great, any other questions? I need a motion to approve the music and theater arts course, the 3D studio art three uh, course, honors course, and the 2D studio art three honors course. So moved. Second, please. Second. Motion is second for the three courses. This is right. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you, and thank you, student board members, for weighing in on that. You're the ones that we're doing this for, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. We have uh, three field trips, um, and I wondered if you all had any questions on the three. I'm going to do a motion for all three together. The, the first one, the ecology trip, they're sleeping in tents. It's their facilities, bathroom, whatever yes, at sir. the house at the farm is that they're going to be able to use and stuff like that. That's my understanding, correct. Have they done this one before? This they have. The environment, I thought so. Yes, this location too. Correct. Any other questions? Hope it doesn't rain. <laughs> I know the others oh, too have it. been used before too. Yes. So I need a motion to approve the field trips for Queen Anne's County High School Environmental Club to Spring Cove Farm. Queen Anne's County High School Marching Band to Hershey Park, and Queen Anne's County High School Band to Music in the Parks Dollywood in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. So moved. Second. Motion is second to approve the three field trips. Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Harper. Yes. Mr. Set. Yes. Mrs. Harlow. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. I have five in the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Next item is the expenditure reports. 
Thank you, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, and board members. Um, in front of you is our monthly expenditure report for um, the first one for FY20. Um, it is reflective as of October 4th because of the timing of a payroll posting. So normally I try to hit it at the end of the month, but um, this is a little more accurate as to you know, where we are currently standing. Um, all categories are in a positive state, as it should be expected for this time of the year, uh, especially this early in the fiscal year. But if I could bring your attention to the detail report, um, I'd like for you to take a look at the special education category. Um, we have already made a transfer from salaries to contracted services, which you'll see in the next agenda item. Um, of concern is the remaining balance of only $37,000 in the uh, category of special education. The large negative there in the transfers line represents two main components. As you know, we're um, participate in the midshore special midshore special education I want to make Eastern sure I got the shore, right way. Eastern Eastern Shore midshore special education mm -hmm. yeah consortium uh, that provides special ed services you know for the counties that participate when we got the bill this year it was hundred and ten thousand dollars more than last year and of course that was not um, budgeted and the reason for that is they're in the same boat with the consortium as we are with our own uh, services that they are not finding employees to provide their services so they are going out and finding contracts which to your point mo most contracts are more expensive than an employee and of course those costs are then passed on to us the other part is as uh, mr. Pender alluded the reason for the bus is we have a few additional uh, non-public placements so those costs are reflective in there so those two costs is what's driving I'll call that shortage in special education um, it's something that needs to be monitored it was a little um, disheartening to have to transfer money already this year to cover those things but those services have to be provided it isn't something that we can basically say no we can't do that so we will just have to look at all of the resources <coughs> that we have and make adjustments where necessary um, this one will take quite a bit of an attention to make sure that we stay in a positive balance throughout the year plus we just okay it's not in this figure I'm sorry the bus that we okay no the bus is in, out of the capital the budget capital. this is the operating budget yes but we okayed our contracts looking at a large scope it didn't seem like we were paying much more for the contractual paying more but when you count benefits and certain benefits and other things it didn't seem like we were that far off that that is correct that's why it allowed us to transfer those dollars from salaries to contract right. and it's a watch and, a and line, that's why you see positive balances in both of those two lines but then the 1000 and 2000 line. consortium the consortium now comes down in the transfers it's something that where we have to budget and expense it per state law you said they had uh, like contract people they had to fill would that be under the same terms that they would aren't are they filling them out at the same that I can't I can't answer that question because that's run that's through what they, that's what they told you what what they do is that several districts the five districts um, mm -hmm. you know our immediate five Queen Anne's Kent Talbot you know Caroline we are together in a group and because the resources are slim as you know we can't all find psychologists speech pathologists occupational therapists we get together and form a group and we um, contract out if we have to we advertise contract out if we have to for services and we all pay into that consortium the cost for acquiring those contracted services has risen and so they pass those costs on to each of the participating districts. Oh, so it wasn't <coughs> contract employees. I must have misunderstood. It wasn't, it's not the employees, it's just the contracts they have to have to get more services brought in. They That's will be employees, just like we did. We, that, uh, we have a group, a consortium group that does the same thing. But we were, we were our co contracts were filling permanent S positions. Their contract, there's, they're requiring more services. Now, do we pay as a, a total, or do we pay what we're, benefits we're getting it? Because so we're probably one of the bigger systems. A couple things, you're correct. Yes. A couple things, the contracted folks are not permanent employees. Mm -hmm. They are contracted for that year, gotcha. that period of mm -hmm. time. So that's one. And yes, we do have some greater needs than some of the other smaller districts in that consortium. And because of that, we can't participate in getting all of the contracted services. So say, for example, we pay into the consortium, but we can't get speech pathologists because if we were able to access the speech pathologists that the consortium acquires, we take them all. So, because we have that many needs, so we don't get speech without. We have to get those on our own. Are we paying for them? Yeah, for the we consortium. Just did it. 
Yeah. No, not the consortium. We can't get them through the consortium. Right. We have to get ours on our own. I guess what my bottom line is, with the, I, it, I know we're getting it as a group because it's we're small, Eastern Shore, but we're getting our we're getting our share of services for what we're paying. So we reviewed this, and I asked the same question um, last year because you know it, it's it's expensive, and nobody can find you know these folks. And so we did take a look, and at that point, yes, it was beneficial for us to stay in the consortium. We weren't expecting this we one hundred and ten thousand dollar increase. Right, so we're going to have to take another look again if that is going to be the trend. Right. What are we getting for that extra hundred ten thousand, Mr. Fister? I mean, getting are we, extra? Are we? Are we well, it, it's it's simple. What we've just talked about over uh, just tonight and even uh, last board meeting, you're seeing a, a change from their budgeted salaries to their budgeted contracted services. Now, I can't speak to the fact that they, you know, a $90,000 employee was replaced with a $90,000 contracted service, but looking at the budget that they send us, the contracted service line for, by obtaining these services is what is driving the increase. So is this an OT person speech? I mean, Multiple, but we don't get, ball. we don't do speech. So it could okay. be a, a psychologist, it could be OT, it okay. could be um, PT, okay. but yeah. So we we're still getting something. On that board. Oh, yes, Ms. Smith that was here, that's and special she, education. Mean, and she's special education, but she also knows the numbers and what. Absolutely. Okay. She's a leader on that board, in fact. Okay, yes. so we got representation okay. there to mm -hmm. make sure I'm that. You to know, look out I'll for our interests. Queen County first. Absolutely. Watch out for Eastern Shore, but mm -hmm. the county first. Okay. Absolutely. And, and when I saw this, I did make the inquiry. The, the, as we are the fiscal agent for the ESMEC consortium, Talbot County and my colleague um, in that county is the fiscal agent for the special ed consortium. So there, we have been having some conversations and it's one of those things where they've got to see where their contracts come in. It's very possible it could be adjusted down, but initially to get that ball rolling, everybody is assessed at July 1. And we'll reassess that as we go forward to make sure that we're not being over assessed. So everybody had to put into the pot. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And everybody equally, percentage wise, paid a lot more than they did last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's a hard thing to predict. It's like a snowstorm, but one or two placements can, I mean, that hundred and two hundred thousand well, we is like a lot of money. Well, we got two students that. last week. Correct. Yes, right. we didn't budget for it. We didn't know, yeah. you know. Right. But when you receive them, you yeah. you pay right. for you them. Have to do it. Yeah. Okay. So I have a couple questions. Um, so we've used almost a hundred percent of our budget in three of our categories. <laughs> we'll have to have more <laughs> to get us through the year, and we're. 278,000 to the whole in the one category, but our bill only went up 110. So why are we so over budget for October? D the additional non-public placements. Okay, that's so one part was of that. Estimated. It's two of them. Was there was two that just this past week. Okay. And once those contracts are in, a, in my financial system, right. that's what drives that number. Right, okay. Oh. And so, see, we well, spent our end time. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're this is a, the letter we send just notifying them because we're still yes. in category. But we're going to get to a point where we're just going to go to them and say we need money. Well, we're going to have to transfer. I mean, money we into can't we can't keep transfer. So when you present that when they get this in their meeting, you're going to make this explanation to them. So yes. So no, so this both of this. I don't know if you want to bundle these together. So they, they they sort of tie together. You know, the expenditure report and the transfer notes. It is for information. So I feel I can speak to both of them. So the letter will go over strictly. Doesn't require your approval. It's just informing because we kept it within special ed right. education. Next month could be a totally different story. You might see a negative there. We'll, we'll analyze that. I'll work with Dr. Kane and staff to mitigate those as much as possible. But at some point, you are correct. We are either going to be transferring from categories and a little early in the year for me to be to be comfortable with that, but that's what we're going to have to do to keep it going. Or you're exactly right. We may have to tap into some additional resources. When, when this is, when they look at this on the county commissioner's meeting, I mean, this is an opportunity to start giving them a heads up. Yes. That this is yeah. well, something completely generally out of I have control. A, yeah, I have a conversation with Mr. Mon every time I send one of these over, just to, you know, if there's any questions or anything like that to come through there. Definitely we do a presentation when it is a request to transfer between categories. Oh, okay. So now they just look at this and know. If yeah, this is just a notification that this is what we're doing. We're yeah, keeping no, but our. They don't. But he's they had, don't still had a this. conversation. He'll have a conversation. Still, yeah, he's still When I send this over tomorrow, I'll have a conversation with him, yes. So that is not actually briefed to the commissioners. I don't want them to take it to the commission. Yeah. It, 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 will, it will be in their information package just as you see information. Ma, Ma is yes. like Dr. Kane, that they go back and forth, but then they 
the commissioners are their board and we're our board. Yeah, and if they have any questions, they'll, they will certainly call me and what is this related to and, and we'll respond exactly as I commented this evening. Okay. So do you need a motion to accept this letter or just um, know that it's going no, out? Mm -mm. You don't have to no vote on the letter. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, that was a combination of expense reports and transfer notice. Um, next item is turf fields. Mr. Pender. Yes, we can go several ways with this. I have a presentation, a few slides if you want to look at usage and what is occurring on our fields yes. rental-wise. Um, I think that would probably be the easiest. Thank you. give an overview of where we are with the turf fields and I apologize it's not on four docks but I was analyzing all of the um, calendars and the agendas from both athletic directors um, and also Park and Rec and what we're going to focus on right now is the time um, from September 1st to November 19th I'm sorry, <laughs> September 1st to November 1st <laughs> And again, looking at the percentage of the athletic teams, the band, the recreation, the rental agreement, to see where we stand with this. This is where I received the information from all of the master calendars. Um, I actually compared what our athletic directors had turned in with what Parks and Recreation had to make sure there was no glitches, and they pretty much lined up um, with this. So, with that being said, um, since September 1st, and again, this is going to go till November 1st, we um, have used the fields at, uh, or the field at Ken Island High School for 244 um, hours, and then at Queen Anne's County High School, 211 hours. So they're fairly com um, compatible with each. Now, what I try to do here, I'm trying to break it down and show you exactly the amount of hours the band the fall athletic teams received for games and practice so i broke it down by high school um, the band at ken Allen high school used the turf fields for 28 hours for um, games and practices field hockey 57 football 39 hours men's soccer 41 and women's soccer 50. Queen Anne's County High School, again, games, practices, and when they have a tournament of band at Queen Anne's High School where Ken Island does not host a tournament of band. So that's why their number was a little bit lower at Ken Island. So the band had it for 53 hours, <coughs> field hockey 31, football 29.5, men's soccer 32, and women's soccer 33. So then we kind of dove down a little bit more. I was kind of interested to see how often they were being rented out to outside groups at Ken Island High School, and then also how often Parks and Rec was using them. So Ken Island High School, for our athletic and band events, we had them for 180 hours. There was only 49 hours for rental, and Parks and Rec used 14.5 hours. Queen Anne's County High School, you're going to see kind of similar numbers, except the rental is a lot smaller. Um, 178 hours for our own students. Uh, rental was 18 hours, and Parks and Rec used it for 14.5 hours. Um, <coughs> that's, sorry, that's a duplicate slide. Here we go. So on this slide here with Ken Island Athletic and Band Practice, I went through to see how many hours they were actually on the turf field using it, who had it reserved, did it match up with all of the calendars. So looking at that, um, the band at Ken Island High School um, 
had practice on the turf field for 28 hours. Field hockey was 39 hours. Football, 25.5. Men's soccer, 23. And women's soccer, 32. You see the numbers under field hockey um, next to football, men's soccer, women's soccer. That is when two teams used it together. So on one end of the field, you might have had field hockey practicing. On the other end, women's soccer might have been practicing. So they were sharing the field during that time. At Queen Anne's County High School, the band had the field for 39 uh, hours, field hockey 13, football 16, men's soccer 14, and women's soccer 15. So it pretty much is parallel across, again, the numbers below field hockey, football, men's soccer is when they were sharing it with another sport. These numbers include games, right? These numbers are just practice. Just practice. Yeah. I, I was interested to see how often the teams and the band were on there for, for games and then also what practice entailed. So they're getting on there. The different teams in the band are, are getting on the fields during the week and on the weekends um, on Saturday for the most part. We had one hiccup that I'll talk about here shortly. So where you're probably getting all um, the information from, as anything starts, you're going to have hiccups in the process. Um, the band has historically used Saturdays to fine tune their performance. Um, Mr. Wright likes to get up on top of the press box and um, you know really get to see what's going on with the flags and also with the different groups. So on October 5th, and this, I'm going back a few weeks before this happened. The AD at Queen's High School was asked, can we, um, by Parks and Rec, if they could hold a field hockey um, play day there for Queen's County teams. The AD said, yes, you could. Some time went by, then they realized there was some issues with that occurring. Parks and Rec had already, you know, sent out all the flyers, all the information, had all the t-shirts printed up. So, on the 5th, from 7 to 10, the band was able to use it. Then they used, I'll show you their practice field here in a minute. They were able to use the practice field um, after that. All the other dates have been honored um, on there and all the times have honored on there. That was the only hiccup that we've experienced. And again, we've had issues down, not issues, but we've had some pop up down the Kent Island where we've had to work with the band or work with different teams just to make sure um, you know, everybody gets adequate time. So that was the issue there. Um, I just kind of wanted to show you at, at Ken Island High School, next to the left of the football field is the band practice field that they can use. Um, also at Queen Anne's County, um, right down here is where the band can use their field um, to practice if we run into an event that has some issues like that. So you know, that was kind of a real quick overview, but I can send that to you, but I really wanted to show you, because I was kind of amazed at some of the numbers too. I felt the rentals would have been a lot higher. Uh, they're not, basically, the rental portion you're seeing, uh, lacrosse teams and some travel soccer um, down to Kent Island. You have basically here at Centerville at Queens County High School, you're having uh, one lacrosse club rented out on Sundays. Um, like I said, th there are going to be hiccups. We had some issues, uh, and I went out there and, and watched the band practice Saturday and, and checked on Parks and Rec, and I'll say this. I was approached by parents also. Hey, there's no toilet paper in the porta pot The porta pot's full. Um, those are all issues that Parks and Rec deals with. Um, they were not our issues. The perception may be that they are. Parks and Rec has chosen to go with porta potties instead of using our um, our facilities, which is fine with me. However, they want to do it. I just ask that they, you know, keep them, you know, in a clean uh, manner. Functionable. And yes, <laughs> um, it didn't really help that the night before we had about five thousand people at uh, a homecoming football game mm -hmm. um, with the porta pot sitting there. So I'm sure that had some kind of a effect on it, but. There's, there's going to be some, uh, some room for improvement um, and, and juggling and things like that. Uh, 
Are there any questions that I can ask? Do answer you feel you? that the MOU needs to be, I mean, no. the explanations need to be extrapolated a little bit more to say who's supposed to do, I mean, who's responsible for this and that? I mean, I don't think so. I think it's pretty well written, written in there, you know, about historically you've used this. And, you know, I've also gained some more well, I'm talking about who's supposed to put the toilet paper in oh, who's supposed to. Yes, that, yeah. So in there it logistics. says what they were, what they're responsible for, yeah. but with the field houses. I know it's in there, but do you want to, you know. We can, we can add that in there. I'll back on for some reason. Um, the problem is we shut our field houses down November 1st because we, they won't, we cannot heat them enough no. for the pipes to freeze. So Parks and Rec chose to just say, hey, we don't really want to use them. We'll put porta pots out there, um, you know. And I think they learned. I think this was kind of their first function of operating. Had a big event the night before. What's in a big event the night before? I mean, they had two um, portable bathrooms over towards like the softball field, you know. Which, to me, they should have been in a little bit more central location for more people to use. But again, I mean, it's it's a live and learn. They only use it. They only have them out there when there's a something they're renting, right? And yes. then they disappear. Right? Yes. Okay. Now the one at the the stadium, that one stays there, you know. And they may even want to increase it to two. I mean, it's you know, it's something that. Uh, Aren't there some in that side parking lot by Ken Island too? Don't they have some outside the gate? Yes. Yep. Like so three or four. They may want to, you know. Yeah. Just based upon it, but like I said, there there are going to be hiccups, and you know I think. A lot of people learn a few lessons out of this one here, you know, and I, you know, I take responsibility for that, but, well, you know, so. I think some of the problems are, it's good that we share facilities because the taxpayer owns them, the Rex can use ours, but when they're on our property, they're going to sit there and think it's a board education issue. Right. And I had the same problem on a Saturday with some gates being locked and stuff for a field hockey game. But I think parks has to be open and, you know, to that, you know, we're going to hear it first, and we're always going to hear it first if it's on the school board, on the school property. But they've got to, and like you said, work it out. And, it's, it's, and it's, I think we could miss something, too. It's the same thing that happens with, you know, basketball in the wintertime for Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they will share in the facility, but it is our facility, and, you know, you need to put the proper procedures in place to make sure it's being maintained mm -hmm. during practice and also on Saturdays when the games are going on and indoor soccer on Sundays. I've been um, there. Oh, I'm there uh, and now. Freezing. Yeah, I've been uh, there. Overall, middle of December, it freezing. works well. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's value. It works well for the citizens of the county. And, it um, does. And like and I said, it'd be easier not to, mm -hmm. but it's not reasonable not to do it yeah. as far as economics. If, if I could okay. point something out, if you bring the pictures back up of the two sure. properties, the difference in the two, which is important to note for the band, because you said he gets up on the on the yes. press box. So in Ireland, you can still do that with their practice field location. Queen Anne's, you cannot. So right up there, yes, that's where Mr. Wright would stand up on that, right in there. So that's the importance, the two difference between the schools. Ken Island can still access the top of that press box from its property view. Right there. Yep where Queen Anne's cannot do that. So he needs that, that visual. Can't they bring that field in closer? I mean, I don't know what the field is at Queen Anne's. No, that, that field right behind the stadium is dedicated to JV football or so, lacrosse? Yeah. yeah. This, way away from that. These two fields right. are for, for football and then also lacrosse in the, um, in the spring. But they're not doing it on a Saturday, right? Yeah, I mean, we could take a look at that. Yeah, they're not really. And it's, and it's not a center view. The, the, the second one below the stadium, the, the square. Yes, sir. That park lot's elevated off that. To a, a little yeah, that's yeah, down so, a hill. So, the, 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 I did, I, I'm old. But then they used to have one of those things you walk up and. You know, at one point I saw one there. I don't know if they I'm not saying, you know, I'm, and I, they don't want, that's old time. Do, do, you know, yeah. I, I came the in scaffolding old. you're talking about was not back in my day. <laughs> That was back in it's the back 90s, in my day, late which 80s. Is before your day. Yeah, I mean, and, but they had something that you roll. It's like in a in a warehouse. You roll it up. When you stand on it, it hits. It's not perfect, and you know. You mean where a band director would stand on top of it mm -hmm. to see? I don't I haven't seen that in years. When those shows are adjudicated, when he goes to TOBs, 
there are judges sitting on top of the press boxes in the stadiums that they're going to. Yeah. So he wants that same vantage, both directors do, so they can fix what the adjudicator is talking about from that same view, whether it's sound distribution or their flags bringing the emotion to the, the show. He can't fix that when he's level mm -hmm. or just above their heads. He needs to see balance and hear it. Yeah, under, I, you know, I just, hopefully they can, like you said, time will take care of some things, but there's going to be another hiccup coming along. Well, I mean, there, there always will be. The learning I mean, curve. I think, you know, like I said, the communication piece. Relationships and working together. You know, and, and, and that really, there was a lot learned out of this. We never have portable potties on our property, do we? Uh, we do at sometimes, yes. Um, mainly most of them are for parks and recs that use our... Um, like out here, they have lacrosse, they have field hockey. What, what I guess baseball. what I'm getting at is so when they, baseball when, and softball. Do you just have said there's one at the stadium. I was we surprised do. at that. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that's. Exciting. I can't say to somebody the the uh, porta potties are not a school board issue. Well, I'll tell you this: in the only time that we have porta potties out there <coughs> are in the spring, baseball, softball. Because if you're looking over there Graduation. to the right side of it, mm -hmm. you know. The field house isn't close by there. The bathrooms aren't close by there. That'd be the only time you see porta potties out there. And don't uh, we besides have besides graduation? Yeah. We had some, yes. If we hadn't had the bas or football game the night before the thing, then it probably wouldn't have been an issue. Probably they pumped, not. The, they pumped them out and cleaned them before. And, and again, that's where Parks and Rec's going to have to learn that hey, you know, mm -hmm. this really didn't work. Um, you know, one other issue came up. They had some uh, vendors parked in, you know, some uh, ADA places you know which you know we can't have that so those are things that you know i've got to communicate with them to make sure they're aware of and you know not blocking in other cars and you know just a little courtesy so we're going to be able to have graduation on these turf fields that's, that's a so question we need to be planning MOU ahead for graduation things in the mou um, so we, we, we are working with principals, addressing that with principals right now. Um, I'm not certain of the outcome, so I certainly don't want to say it publicly, okay. uh, but we are working on that right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we don't know? At this point, no, I don't. Okay. I mean, and that's when we can fight for extra money for it if we need to, because with the county commissioners, they wanted the turf fields, and I mean, that's something I think we, well, because we need to be ready to, we do, to early to be able to talk about that. Right. And if we do, do we need any additional equipment because Covered they're field. turf fields? Yes. yes. And have you, you have those to, budget items been yes. taken care of? We're no. and it's okay. not cheap. Okay. I'm sure. All right. Okay. It is addressed in the MOU, though, under scheduling. That they would schedule it. That they're given prior dates for Kent Island and Queen Anne's graduations before September 1st each year. So but it's in there, then we, we dates we have. Dates. <laughs> yeah, dates. We when you dates. say not cheap, yeah. is there a ballpark figure? You're not that close to it. I'm not that close to it. Yeah. It's the chairs you use have to be sleds. You know, you can't have just. Well, the chairs have to be. Yeah. You just can't put a carpet over them. And you may need oh. a, may need a new stadium. So there's a, a few. Uh, yeah, there's. May need a I, new it ain't uh, simple. Stand. Uh -huh. Bottom line is, it could be awful tough to have graduation in the stadiums. It could be. And I'll be honest with you, the other day, uh, when we had that 91 degree weather, mm -hmm. went down to the stadium just curious to see. How hot it was down there. Uh, 126 mm. on the field. Oh. Um, three feet above the field, it was 105. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's really something to take in consideration of, uh, you know, graduation. I, your feet could feel it, I tell you. Well, on the health of some of the visitors, family members that are coming for graduations, so we talked year. about last year with passing so out. I, 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 I would so love to see this get resolved, well, not, early. not today, right. but earlier than yeah. May of next year. Oh, Thank certainly. You. I mean, we're talking about it now. Yeah. Right. Understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to say we'll time frame, plenty, but I think. We'll I have think. plenty of advance notice, whatever the decision is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fender. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pender. Yeah. I'll send you this. Okay. Go bonkers now, not the baby. Okay. Anyone out there for community participation? 
No. <laughs> okay, future meetings and events, October 16th, which is next Wednesday, is our uh, work session. Uh, November 6th is our next school board meeting. Any other questions about Four o'clock. Yeah. Um, five o'clock. It's our work session, so it's five to eight. Um, I do have something I, I need to uh, address to the board. Um, and uh, Mr. Smith and I have both have been um, contacted by uh, county commissioners and state delegates. They would like us to revisit um, the school calendar for 2021 um, about starting after Labor Day. Um, they feel that um, they want us to start after Labor Day. Uh, this Peter Rancho has come out with a new um, uh, study on the impact, the financial impact, and uh, they feel that it's important that we stay within that model. I know that Talba County is, uh, and Caroline County are working on theirs this week or this month. Um, I don't know what everyone else feels, but it was something that they felt they felt very strongly about asking us to relook at. Okay. Well, we'll put that on our work session for next Wednesday. That's I mean, I, That's my first priority topic. would be students. I mean, and of course, you have a schedule that you have to have so many days doing things. I don't know how many students in August. You know, you, the first learn you know, how much to, but then you got to find the days you got to do it. And I think sooner, to, that's another thing. Look at it, study it, and try to make a rational decision on that. So we need to put it on the, we don't have an agenda, so people don't know we're talking about it. So we need to put it on next week's uh, work session. Well, and and then the, we'll have a long discussion about it. This and have some input, because Dr. Kane's going to tell us yeah, what, so good, good and bad, what sure, can happen and sure. not happen. We it. did that last year, and the board voted and approved um, the calendar as it is, but the, we're bringing it back up, so we'll... We'll have the conversation. Okay. I, I, w I wouldn't bring it up if I if they weren't pretty emphatic about you know having us. Do they realize it. how late the start yeah. will be? Uh, yeah. I, I completely yeah. aware. I made sure of it. Um, but and it's and all about, that it's all about add students. Add we have to remember that. I, That's I, the priority. I'm all, the end of the year. I, and it's priority. Believe me, I laid it out. I pulled my calendar out. I said, gentlemen, this is what it's looking like. But I also don't want to bite the hand that feeds us. Okay, need a motion to adjourn. And a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.